7th Village Board Work Session. This meeting is called to order. We'll begin with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, welcome everyone. We have an exciting agenda filled with lots of uh, presentations. Uh, and there's also a lot going on in the community these days as it's spring and everybody's out and about. And so I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, anybody else on the board who has some announcements they'd like to kick us off with. Sure. Um, Saturday night, as part of the Austin Second Saturday Jazz Series, um, Austin's own Alexis Cole will be uh, singing. Uh, she'll be doing a trio. And it uh, starts at 7.30. That's at the Elks Lodge, 118 Croton Avenue. Um, uh, you can go to the, the uh, Facebook page, um, or you can get a hold of me if you want tickets. Or whatever. the tickets are at the door, but if you want a reservation, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, so I'm looking forward to Alexis call this Saturday night, 7.30 at the Elks Lodge. Thanks. Anyone else? Um, sure. Sierra. Good evening, everyone. So tomorrow, evening the Mike Risco band will be at Maya Riviera it's a benefit for the Austin High School um, PTSA and um, it's no cover but it is 20, 21 and over and it's always great to be able to support an Austin business and also one of the organizations that support our schools that's all I had tonight thank you okay well there um, um more. yeah just just quickly um, just FYI, it's National Poetry Month, so if you're into poetry, uh, please, uh, you know. Are you going to oh. read something? Uh, no, 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 I did, I did, I did want to read totally something. Totally right. I know, I know, I, I was, I, I really wanted to read something, and um, also, yes, there's a shredder this, oh, this Saturday, Saturday. yes, Thank you. Uh, County Shredder at the uh, Austin Recreation from what time to what time? Uh, 10 to 2. 10 to 2, and also, this is the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act that was passed by Congress over 50 years ago. Thank so you. today, yeah, today, yeah. Wow. Great. Um, we have a number of announcements, and you know, there was one I was just looking for. I don't know if anybody else has handy. The uh, Public Service Commission is going to be hosting some public hearings on. Or do you have a, an email on that you can pull right. up? Because there's there's like four of them happening in Westchester. Printed it out. And it's at home. Me too. But it's not <laughs> I can forward it to the board and maybe put it on the website or something or on the web. Last it's tomorrow. happening next. It's happening next week, and it's in a few different locations. Ones in Somers, ones in White Large Plains. Mod, summer in yeah. daytime, summer in the evening, um, and it's an opportunity for anybody who has some feedback in the wake of the. Um, uh, power outages with the storm. Um, all of the uh, the Public Service Commission. Uh, one of their tasks is to investigate uh, how the aftermath of the storms was handled by the power companies. So um, there are definitely some community members who want to be heard on that, so that their concerns can be considered. Um, also, we'd like to welcome Neighbors Link has officially opened their location on Spring Street in Ossining, and they they had a. Uh, a welcome meeting with a number of stakeholders this week where they talked about some of their programs that are already underway. They've been doing some programming actually for a couple of years in Austin, but now they have a home to be able to do it in, including um, job training programs and uh, their ESL program that they just began has more students than they even have spots. So we're delighted to hear about so many folks taking advantage of the opportunity to learn English. Um, and for they are looking for volunteers. So if you are interested, you do not need to be able to speak Spanish. If you would like to help other folks learn English or to um, work with uh, parents on parenting programs. Um, they have training and um, all are welcome. Check out neighborslink.org. Um, this weekend uh, marks the beginning of parade season for Ossining, and it is uh, an unusual route. It's the only route that, um, the only one of the parades that takes this route. We walk from Roosevelt School beginning at 8.30 on Saturday morning down to Veterans Park, and then that is kickoff for recreation baseball season. Um, so. Uh, 8.30 in the morning is step off, yes. So uh, we get to be there even before that to line up. Um, and then uh, we have more parades to come, never fear. Um, the following weekend is the eighth annual Earth Day Festival. We, um, it's, it's been expanded hours. It starts at 10 in the morning now and goes till five in the afternoon. There's live music events. It's the biggest Earth Day celebration in Westchester County. It's at our beautiful waterfront. Be sure to come down. Um, there's something really great for everyone. It's lots of fun. Um, and 
keeping along the environmental theme, the following Friday, which is February the 27th, it's an unusual night of the week for the documentary and discussion series. Did I say February 27th? That would not be anytime soon at all. Um, thank you. April 27th uh, at 6.30 in the evening at the Austin Public Library is um, an inconvenient sequel and some really, really terrific panelists, some of whom um, are familiar to the, uh, all of us in municipal government, John Nolan. Um, who is the head of the Land Use Law Center at Pace uh, Law School will be on the panel, as will Nancy Seligson, who is the town supervisor in the town of Romerick, and they've done some really terrific um, progressive uh, environmental initiatives in their town that we look forward to learning about. Um, I think that's all I, ha all I have on my list, so Manager hey, McDonald. All right. Well, I am very happy today to be introducing you to Bill Garrison. Bill has uh, been long awaited. He is our new Parks and Rec superintendent. Uh, he's been here uh, a week. He came back this week, so we were really happy. <laughs> and I uh, just wanted to introduce you and uh, ask Bill just to say a few things about himself and maybe what he's looking forward to as far as working with us. So. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, I've been in the recreation field for uh, close to going on almost 30 years. So I've been around for a while. Um, I have a little bit of a diverse background. I worked at the Children's Village in Dobbs Ferry for a while doing recreation and after school programming. And for the last three years, I was the assistant superintendent in Newcastle. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Um, one of the things that intrigued me about Austin is just the, the diverse community and the facilities that you have as far as the community center and the park. So I'm looking really forward. I've been spending my last uh, week here, week and a half, just getting to know people. And uh, as I was saying to one of the, the trustees before um, people just keep coming in my door and, and I'm meeting people and everybody knows somebody else and did you meet this person yet no I haven't met that person yet but looking forward to it um, there's a you know just in my short few days here there's so much going on in this community and just trying to get a grip on that um, is, is my first challenge but um, I will do that and I will I'm very excited about moving forward on some things and getting to work with the people in this community Welcome, Bill. Thank you Thank so you. much. We are thrilled to have you here. Nobody more thrilled than Debbie since she's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's okay. Maybe Jamie's as thrilled, but um, they, yeah. they've uh, they've been um, you know helping to support the work of that uh, department for a number of months now. Right. So we know you have a lot um, on your plate, and we couldn't be more excited and and happy to be able to support you in whatever way that we can. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Bill? Bill had his first taste of the. Uh... Ah. Parks and Rec Board uh, meeting. Yes. Right. The advisory board. Monday, yeah. Monday night, yeah. It was great. It was all good. Everyone behaved. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a very positive board. Yes. <laughs> good. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Bill. Thank, Thank you, you, Bill. Enjoy your evening. Now everybody knows what he looks like. So. Yes. <laughs> so when you see him around, introduce yourself and welcome him and, and be gentle. He's got a lot on his plate. Right. So, um, what I did not put on the agenda, and just before we ask Linda to come up and talk, is we have our new personnel director with us as well, Tanya Orr. So Tanya, do you want to just say like, hello? You don't have to say a lot. Well, I'm short, so I won't probably. You have to, oh, so they can hear you on TV. Yeah, but we can sorry. move the microphone down. Move that up. Can I, can I do yeah. this? Yes, sure. absolutely. It bends. Yeah. OK. And, and I came and got sick. You know, go <laughs> so today's my third day. I do have a, also a mixed bag of experience. I've worked in corporate and private. I've also worked for school districts, and I come from North Castle, not Newcastle. <laughs> so um, I worked there for about three years under um, you know, town administrator, and was very happy. And when this opportunity came up, she encouraged me as well because she thought it would be a great opportunity for me to grow. And I've heard great things about the village. I have met uh, well. I have friends who actually live within the village. I don't know where, just you know, acquaintances that I've met. <laughs> But um, everybody has really good things to say, and I've met, you know, I think uh, it wasn't any intimidation, as Debbie said, no intimidation, but my meeting with 12 people when I came on board, I was interviewed uh, with 12 of the department heads, which was very nice. So, so far, so good. I hope that I make you all proud. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yes, it, it was quite a uh, final interview process with uh, just a few candidates, and we had all the directors sitting around, and I walked them in, and they were like, oh, my goodness, you know, that's kind of an unusual uh, <laughs> situation. And I said, don't be, don't be worried, and she just said, 
She goes, got this. And I went, she's in. <laughs> so we're excited to have you. And now we would like to have Linda come up and talk about what's happening in HR as she gets ready to uh, depart. Linda, would you like to sit at the table? Yeah, come sit at the oh, table. Sure. Jamie's ready to share her microphone with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, we will let the public know that this is, we expect, your last Village Board meeting. Yes, and we are delighted to have you here with us and can't wait to hear what you have to say. And um, I'll let you get started. We'll chat more about big picture stuff when you're done. Okay, it's, it's been a while since I had the opportunity to actually update the board. As you know, um, we used to come to the meetings monthly and I used to get up there and tell you about all my training that we were doing. But um, personnel actually does a lot more than that. And uh, actually 2018 has been a very, very busy year so far since the beginning. We've been actively canvassing and interviewing for multiple positions, the superintendent of recreation, the assistant building inspector, code enforcement officer, director of code enforcement, office assistant, a promotion in the police department, and last but not least, our personnel director. Um, all of these positions are appointments from a civil service list, and I'm sure you've all heard the nightmares about civil service at times, but we don't let them get us down. So uh, we did our canvassing and it produces candidates that are interested in the position. And then from there, we do our interviews, our backgrounds and screenings, and we need to choose the most qualified among the three uh, who's the best fit as well as their, their skills and, and their qualifications. <coughs> and uh, the responsibilities are also beyond staffing. They're very multifaceted. Uh, one of our key functions is supporting the village manager and the other department managers in the administration of work rules and the collective bargaining agreements. Another very important function is to investigate any allegations of harassment, workplace violence, or discrimination. Once the village is notified of any such situation, immediate corrective action is taken and a thorough investigation must be completed as soon as possible and the process is intensive. The investigation entails many important components, such as interviewing all witnesses, uh, weeding out any possible motives for filing a complaint, and finally arrive at an unbiased determination of whether the situation rises to the definition of harassment, discrimination, or violence. Then appropriate disciplinary action will be imposed if warranted. We also are responsible for compliance with the federal DOT regulations as well as, our, um, as, well as the drug-free workplace. Our vendor performed uh, quarterly random drug and alcohol testing at the end of January, and I'm pleased to report that all drug and alcohol tests were negative. So each quarter between five and 10 commercial drivers are randomly selected, as well as an equal number of safety sensitive employees. The village has 33 commercial drivers and 34 safety sensitive employees. And all employees are subject to random testing, including our police department. We are required to drug test 25% of our CDL drivers annually and administer alcohol tests to 10% of CDL holders in compliance again with the federal DOT regulations. The vendor also keeps us in compliance by providing annual educational services to CDL drivers giving them current information with respect to any changes to their CDL licenses, as well as um, new changes in the drug testing. We went from a five panel to a 10 panel drug screen this year, and they are testing for all of these synthetic drugs, including all the opioids, so that's a good thing. We also do our employee uh, health and dental benefits. We facilitate the execution of these contracts and negotiate the administrative contact, uh, contracts, rather with longer terms, locking in costs for a period greater than one year. We also pride ourselves in working as a liaison to our health plan administrators to assist employees and retirees alike in uh, billing problems as well as uh, <coughs> correcting any denials for service. And we've established a wonderful working relationship which enables productive and positive results for our employees. Last, also, we uh, administer our workers' compensation. In the workers' compensation cases, we work with uh, nurse case managers. So that expedites the approval process for testing, and our goal is to get our employees back to work sooner rather than later. 
and I know it would be complete if I didn't talk about safety. So <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we have begun our 2018 safety training. In January, we completed the annual safety walkthrough for the workplace violence and harassment policies. Annual pest training is taking place tomorrow, bright and early, seven o'clock in the morning, for half of the DPW parks and water department staff. In total, approximately 65 employees will undergo full day training in multiple topics required on an annual basis by PESH. Safety training is ongoing throughout the spring and fall to ensure employees are given the tools they need to go home to their families at the end of the day. As you are aware, I am retiring next week. After a 20 year career, 27 year career in the municipal personnel field, the last 10 of which have been in the village of Austin. I feel very blessed to have had the opportunity to work with and alongside of so many wonderful and dedicated people. I know I will look back at the experience and have had, that I've had in the village with fondest memories and gratification. Thank you to everyone I have come to know and learn from. Since Monday, I am so pleased to be able to work alongside of Tanya Orr to share with her the many wonderful aspects of being the personnel director in the village of Ossining. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Oh. Um, Linda, I, I can't thank you enough and I know your, your position is not one that the public usually knows much about because really you work with our staff and you have done such a remarkable job at um, elevating the level of professionalism in our how the village functions. You're incredibly kind with everyone which often is in difficult circumstances when people come to you whether they're entering their workforce the workforce here at the village or if they're they're dealing with something challenging in their position and you are impeccably professional, kind, and thorough, and discreet in every situation that I've ever been aware of you handling. And frankly, I'm not aware of most of them because you do it so well. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to just take a five minute break for us to be able to um, provide you with a, a little token gift from the board oh, and maybe you. take a couple of pictures and say goodbye and thank you and your husband is here as well and I know you have uh, another what seven days with us Who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> we have an exciting agenda to get to after that but we would like to take just a five minute break so we can have a little more fun thank you all righty so uh, my motto. we should mention um, we sometimes give people proclamations upon their retirement after a length of service with the, of the village, but um, last fall, Linda was awarded Employee of the Year, at which time she collected a nice little um, trophy case of um, proclamations. So we didn't add to that, but we did give her a little token thank you, and we are really, really grateful for her service. And you've been very busy in hiring. I'm glad Linda was here to help you through some of that, and I'm glad we've got it some really great. great people started. Awesome. You're so um, happy today. This is great. You're, like, <laughs> you're shining. Oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's a good glow. So I'm delighted, I'm delighted that we get to um, welcome some folks who uh, are next from the uh, Sing Sing prison. Um, they have a big construction project and um, you know Sing Sing prison is uh, the correctional facility is actually the largest employer in the village and the um, facility has grown up with our village. The village was founded in 1813 and the original cell block was 1825. So um, our histories are inextricably linked. Um, uh, that said, Many people in the village will never go inside the walls, uh, but we're certainly aware of its presence, and there's going to be a big project coming up, and so we wanted everyone to know what to expect and uh, for the board members to be aware of it in case folks in the community are asking, and we can try and ask some questions tonight to, uh, to make sure we're aware of what's going on. So thank you very much, Superintendent Capra, and we appreciate you reaching out to us to let us know what to expect yes. and for bringing your team here tonight. Yes, I have. So uh, this is Assistant Commissioner Corcoran. Welcome. And Larry Fitzpatrick, who is one of the engineers on the project. Um, so we had a meeting about a month or two ago, mm -hmm. and uh, several of you attended the facility. And you know, we appreciate the great relationship that we have with the village. It's uh, you know our events. We invite you to all our events. You graciously come. You speak at our events. So we really enjoy that. We also appreciate the chief, you know, and his input. He does a great job. His guys do a great job assisting us 
um, with just a lot of stuff. Communication is very open, and I think you know this era, this season, last few years, we really uh, appreciate the village very much, and, and all the departments, the fire department, uh, which is why I'm here tonight to talk <laughs> about our range. Unfortunately, our range burnt down after we spent a good amount of money actually trying to you know maintain it a little bit more and get a few more years out of it and it just wasn't meant to be uh, so we are in the midst now of building a new range uh, and the new range if if um, you can imagine the back of the facility uh, is eight called 18 grounds there's a big big gate that's up there um, on state street new power the new power it's yeah all the way in the back um, what's the name of that street that's all the way in uh, you wouldn't know but at any rate, uh, the, our new powerhouse is back there. Okay. Um, so it's not far from there where we'll be building this new range. You know, in the past, we've had uh, a good relationship even with the Condominium Association. There's a number of key people that we call up there. If some, uh, we've done night shooting up there in the past. We have parties at our QWL, which at the time was adjacent right to. Many of you, if not all of you, have been down there uh, at some of our parties. Uh, and they'll call up, hey, they're making a lot of noise. My watch commanders, who are lieutenants, they have all been around for a long time. They shut it down right away. So we, again, the economy of people really appreciate it, too. Anytime we do any work with our powerhouse, sometimes we have to, uh, we spray water inside the system, and it creates a steam. And that could be a panic if you don't know what that is, especially in today's world. So my secretary will literally call several people in the community to say, hey, and they appreciate that. And so that's the kind of relationship that we have. Uh, and they're free to call us. And I, I get people directly emailing me about a whole bunch of stuff that's from the village. And, and we like that kind of open, open communication. And we have a lot of respect for the, you know, all the people that are in the village. And yes, we do have, uh, there's a lot of employees that live here in the village, in the town, in the surrounding areas. We employ close to 1,000 people, a little less. We have 400 and something volunteers that come into the facility. We have uh, 2,500 to 3,000 visitors, inmate visitors come uh, to Ossining every month to visit our people, our inmates, and, uh, and they use a lot of the local you know, restaurants, stores. Um, and so it, it, it does, we do, you know, we have a, a very vital relationship. So um, the good thing about this range, the exciting thing about this range, is I don't want to say it's soundproof, but, it, but we have the sound studies which we have shared with you, uh, and we know what the village ordinances are for day and evening. Uh, so we don't suspect that we're going to get any phone calls from anyone ever about noise because, relatively speaking, from a layman's terms, that's why I brought these experts with me, it's like you know, less than closing a, a, a car door is the noise that you hear. Uh, and in the location that we're in, that we are building in is, um, it's kind of into the side of a mountain. Whatever whatever reverberation is is going to happen there even dampens that much more. If you look at a top gra graphical map, it looks like we're you know we're right on top of houses and the church up there. But the way the engineers have looked at it and uh, I guess tested sounds and did all the, the studies that they do, they're very very uh, happy about. Um, the minimal impact it will have noise-wise on the village uh, and even in the in the construction process so that's my piece as this as the superintendent uh, Larry was with us the last time as one of the engineers assistant commissioner uh, is here also to just to lend support and so you know how serious we take uh, you know communicating with you guys at this level so if you have any questions about sound uh, I could leave it up to these two gentlemen here Mayor Codden. Um, thank you for coming and uh, appreciate your uh, kind words and uh, about our relationship. And um, uh, I guess my questions really just are more on a timeline and, you know, when, when the more, um, I guess, extensive construction would be just to kind of let um, the neighbors and the village residents know so kind of when things are going to happen, when it's, when you, when, when's your start, when's your completion, when would you see the majority of of either external noises of, of that kind so people would know. So the bids are out. Already. Superintendent, could you just come closer to the mic oh. so they can hear you? No, I'm going to have Larry explain All this. right. Yeah, Larry's, uh, <laughs> has this down to the side. <laughs> okay, okay, great. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome. Thanks. Again, Larry Fitzpatrick representing OGS. So we're the construction management team on the project. 
Uh, so right now, the, the project, it's a public procurement, so that bid period has ended and we have received bids. We're in our vetting process, so we're going through all the low bidders right now. Um, we've interviewed the bidders. We expect in the next 30 to 45 days or so, depending on award by the Office of State Comptroller, we'll probably have a notice to proceed to the contractors. Uh, that being said, you know, the, the main question was the, what kind of noise impacts with the construction. So the major construction is precast panels, which are going to be made in a factory. So they're going to be delivered to the site in enormous pieces on a truck set in place by a crane. So, you know, our, our major site work is really foundations and footings, some steel erection, you know, we'll have some bolting that'll be noisy at times, but our, our work shift is, you know, 7.30 to three. So, you know, during the normal work day, nothing, n nothing ever beyond our construction duration is two years. Um, our goal, which is kind of an aggressive goal, but you know, that's what I'm here for. You know, we hope to have the building enclosed by the end of the year, because as far as my construction schedule is concerned, I, I really need my guys pushing throughout the winter and into the spring to, to meet all our schedules. So, you know, as far as noise, I, I don't want to say during construction, there's going to be no noise, but oh, there no, will I... be, there will be minimal noise and, and it'll all be focused during the daytime. So it sounds like it's really more mechanical noise than anything else. Absolutely. And, 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 and I mean, are, are you using any, um, w will there be a lot of excavation that will have to be done to, to get the site going or? Not an extensive amount. So, so the way the site is designed right now, and I don't know if you're familiar with the, with the site as it's laid out, but as the site is laid out now, it kind of, there's, there's a couple of elevation changes and, and for easy, I'll use my hands. So the, the entrance to the firing range is going to be about here and the, the end of the range will be about here. So we're building into the hill. So there's not a whole lot of excavation that we need to do on the hill. The major excavation will be focused on the structure to put in footings and foundation. That's about it. Who, who would be doing the uh, engineering review of the, uh, of the construction? As far as... Well, just, just looking, I mean, you're building into the side of a hill, so I guess I just want to understand, I mean, obviously there are plans and engineers are going to review them and look at all that stuff. So, so that's... Would you, be, would you be bringing in, you know, our folks from the village, like our engineers, to kind of take a look at things, or... Uh, no. Never. State no. site. So, yeah. so I, can, I can always ask. You so know. because, you know, and, and it's a good question. Be because this is all public funding, it's all public procurement, so it's an open bid to all uh, engineers that are out there so that bid period has opened and closed that's been awarded the contract is already designed we've gone out to bid documents to contractors and those documents well, are now available and yeah I just I, I guess I just want to yeah He's so you're, you're it huh I'm the guy we have blueprints and as they you go should probably just step over to the mic if you're gonna talk that's all so we have thank you I appreciate blueprints it and as they go along to uh, we sat down initially and we came up with the concept of what we were looking for. That took forever to do. Sure. <laughs> Actually, since I got to this facility six years ago as a superintendent, we was looking to rebuild a new range. So there was been so many different uh, you know, shots at where this is gonna be, how it was gonna be. So when we got to this particular range, unfortunately our range went down, um, that was the first part. What are we looking for? What are we looking to do? So the difference between this range, this new range and the one we have is this new range is completely closed. So it's heated, it's ventilated. Um, we can use it all sorts of times. Uh, it, it opens up uh, a lot of doors, even for the village. I know the chief and I have talked. It's, sa it's gonna save you guys a little bit of money because I'm gonna invite you guys to use our range as good neighbors as we always have in the past. But the sound is, is the great portion of it. And as Larry explains, and as I've been involved from my position anyway in all the contracts, uh, and the different construction projects. We're very particular about what time it goes out because I'm paying my staff to oversee. And in this case, it'll be outside the wall, so there necessarily won't be any officers assigned to the project, but it's during the day. So if you're building a, a house in the village, this would be probably comparable to that type of noise. Okay. Um, and then these guys have the responsibility to over, uh, oversight for the actual contracts and the blueprints themselves. So I have a set of blueprints that I don't understand half of. Uh, and that's why Larry and his team are on board. And they're very meticulous about, uh, you know, how it's built and, and the electric that goes into it, the phones, the, 
you know, the internet wiring that we have to have for computers and all that jazz. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I mean, pr pretty much. I, I just want some communication to know about, you know, either challenges with roads, making sure you're talking to uh, Chief Sylvester and, you know, a any other there emergency. There won't be any impact because it's all on my property. Okay, so fair enough. You won't have any, there won't be any of that happening. Okay. And, and quite honestly, even when something, if I have, if I have an, a, a tent, you know, like a, a escape suit drill, I'm on the phone with directly. We, ha we have each other's. When he had the accident, when there was the accident a week or so ago, he was on the phone with me in the middle of the night. And uh, so we, d we have a great relationship. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Herrera, I see you uh, approaching your microphone. I just wanted to first say it's good to see you again, Superintendent Capra and team. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to just let our, neighbor, um, our Austin residents know what's going to be going on on the property, even though it's an enclosed. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone that if um, any general questions about the procurement, about why this particular consulting firm was chosen, how the project got funded, who, um, who was part of that. It's all available through the Office of General Services. Um, so um, I guess we could maybe put that on the website in case you know people want to learn more about the project. But um, I'm pretty confident um, I was able to be at your initial scoping session with um, our mayor and other um, team leaders, so um, I hope the project goes well and um, it suits well. And from what I hear, it's going to be a, a potential cost saving for the state, which is always good. Yes. Yeah. So, thank you. Is Levin or Basemore? Do you have any questions or comments? No. Yes. Did you? Would you like to comment, please? Um, I'm Steve Crisoli, Assistant Commissioner for Administration, and uh, since I drove all the way down from Albany, I just wanted to <laughs> have an opportunity to Make introduce myself. Please, please. Um, <laughs> just, I mean, Larry, uh, Larry works for Lero. Lero, uh, they're specialized in this. They're they're uh, experts in range construction. They've had a host of engineers, multidiscipline engineers. They have geotech, soil engineers, structural, electrical, mechanical. Um, it's an exciting project for us. It, we're, we're dealing with a hardship right now, not having our range. Uh, we strive to be good neighbors. We feel that this range is going to alleviate some of the, will be better in terms of noise issues experienced with the other range. And um, with the team that we assembled and throughout the entire design, we were conscious of the impact on the community. So we, we, right from the get-go, we knew we wanted to make it as quiet as possible. We've utilized the most uh, quiet materials and sound-absorbing materials. So, and the sound studies that have been spoken to demonstrate that there's really, the chances are that construction is going, will be noisier probably then, and it won't be that noisy at all. So we're very confident that this is going to be uh, not an issue to the community. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for making the trip down from <laughs> Albany. You. And um, for all of you for being good neighbors and for reaching out to us with plenty of notification so that our team could be aware of it. And um, so we're uh, somewhat well informed if anybody uh, has questions about what's going on um, on the, the grounds of Sing Sing uh, Correctional Facility because, um, you know, as you said, you do have some neighbors that uh, uh, if they see steam or rising, they, they, they is cause for concern uh, when there was the fire at the previous firing range uh, that prompted this project it was it was certainly cause for concern because you know we're, we're sensitive to the importance and the delicate work that you do and grateful um, for the really really positive relationship we have and also I'm pleased that it's going to save money for um, your department for for docs and I'm also really pleased at um, uh, the opportunity for our police department to do more of their regular firearms training right here in Austin. So thank you so much for being a, a particularly good neighbor in that regard. We look forward to that, um, to that opportunity. So if there's no other questions or comments, then um, then thanks so much for, for coming well, to Village Hall. I look forward to well, seeing you. The 13th. Yes. Our memorial service. So. All right. Thank, thank you me. very much, Superintendent, Assistant Commissioner, Engineer. All right. Uh, Debbie, are you going to uh, grab in our doc extension team? Okay, so I'll give a, a little uh, tap dancing introduction here as the folks come back into the room. Um, oh, good. 
So uh, Gareth Huffam is going to be uh, joining us and leading the discussion. He has with him here Ed Weinstein, who is the doc designer. Gareth is the um, head of the nonprofit organization Hudson Valley Arts and Science that was actually the grant applicant and is, is leading this project as the nonprofit, but it's a really big team of um, organizations that are working together. We are looking tonight at iteration 29 of the um, doc uh, design and um, each level of design um, is seeking to um, incorporate the uh, wisdom and druthers of um, organizations including the municipalities, the Doc um, Austin Boat and Canoe Club, um, working with the Clearwater because we'd love to be able to have the Clearwater dock on our waterfront and they've also been very helpful in understanding the needs of, of larger ships um, which we can't accommodate currently um, as well as uh, Ginsburg Development Companies who is helping fund um, the uh, the portion of the grant that is uh, actually not in kind, but is, is cash um, contribution. So it's been it's been a really collaborative effort, um, a, as well as the state and um, federal regulatory agencies. So it's it's um, it's a, a lot of interests and priorities that are being accommodated. Hence, version 29. So, Lynn, uh, do you want to um, take it from there? Sure. Just to unpend your statement. Also, um, let's not forget Metro North and the waterway. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so just some brief introductory remarks tonight. Um, so the goal of this grant was to design a multi-purpose pier that could provide Hudson River access for both Austin residents and visitors. The grant, as the mayor said, um, gathered together a diverse group of riverfront stakeholders to imagine a design for a dock that would benefit um, both the existing users and f um, promote future enjoyment of the waterfront for commuters and visitors and of course our residents. Um, so over the past year, Gareth Huffam of Hudson Valley Arts and Sciences, um, who will um, go through a detailed discussion with you of the process, has been patiently guiding the group through the 29 potential concepts. Um, and Edward Weinstein of Edward Weinstein Architecture and Planning will discuss the technical as aspects of the design and how we actually reached option 29. And he has revised, modified, and improved the various drawings to help ensure that we've accounted for all the comments and concerns and desires of the various stakeholders. Um, so our, our initial wish list for this was quite lengthy and diverse, and some of the initial items were stricken off the list um, by the regulatory agencies. Other ideas were creatively refined by the group and developed into what is now option 29. Okay. I'll scooch. Good evening. Can you hear me all right? There we go. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you tonight and to uh, bring you up to date on uh, the, uh, uh, the, the project, which is the peer completion design and permitting of the uh, Village of Ossining uh, Pier. And um, so um, for, for those of you who haven't seen uh, uh, this uh, any of this before uh, and because we started a couple of years ago I'll do some backtracking fill in uh, some of the history for you oops so um, in this presentation I'm going to start with talking about the purpose of tonight's presentation a little more um, go through the background both of the waterfront a little bit on the waterfront uh, background itself and the background of the project and how it came to be uh, talk about the process steps uh, up to date what we've done uh, where we are now and what the the future uh, steps will be uh, and then Ed will uh, as, as uh, Lynn said I'll show you option 29 and uh, answer technical questions uh, about it so tonight I really wanted to update the board uh, concerning the status of the project uh, and if we uh, if we can we would like to ask for a vote of confidence uh, from the board uh, on this design uh, before we go before the uh, federal and state agencies for uh, the formal permitting process. So uh, regarding history of the waterfront, as you know, uh, Austin was a, um, a, a burgeoning uh, uh, waterfront port um, back in the uh, late 1700s, starting in the late 1700s and sort of coming to fruition in the early 1800s. That uh, started to decline a bit uh, with the building of the railroad, 
Um, but it, it remained a, a vibrant waterfront uh, into, you know, perhaps the 1920s or so. Uh, and this is, uh, is a photograph of uh, Ossining's very own uh, river boat, which is called the Sarah Jenks. And on the left, you can see it, um, it. You can't quite read it, but right on the back there, it says Ossining. It's a home port. Uh, and uh, on the right, it, uh, the photograph shows it sort of tucked into right where the, uh, the pier is um, uh, now, the pier stub that exists, and where we're planning to uh, or hoping to uh, extend the pier. There's another photograph of, we think, a, a different um, uh, boat on the Ossining waterfront. And you can see uh, that it was um, uh, uh, you know, abundantly used and enjoyed. And this photograph is probably from around the 1890s or so. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, Henry Gordine's uh, fishing crew. Uh, Henry Gordine, as, as uh, many of you may know, is a uh, very famous Hudson River fisherman who um, uh, sort of brought a, a lot of uh, honor to uh, Ossining in the last uh, 25 years with many articles in New York Times about uh, him and uh, his uh, uh, fishing and uh, the traditions of fishing, and this was this was um, his uh, fishing house uh, right down uh, at the what is now called the Gordine uh, Park Village Park. So the background of the Pier Project uh, in the 2008 time frame, uh, the Village Board of Trustees requested Metro North to move uh, their ferry terminal from its original position at the end of the Village Pier through an angle northward so that they would reopen the end of the pier uh, for future extension to deeper water and also so that the end of the pier could be enjoyed by uh, the citizens of Ossining, which they could not while the ferry was there uh, blocking the way. Uh, Metro North complied with the request and uh, they completed it in about uh, 2011. So the pier is ready for extension. This is a photograph of Ossining at 2010 time frame. So you can see the first part, let me use uh, uh, this. Uh, the first sort of 100 feet is um, the village of Ossining Pier. It's a wooden pier. And uh, from, th from that point out was the uh, ferry terminal, which uh, was uh, blocked off with gates and, and so forth. So. Um, uh, when they made the revision, uh, we had they moved it, as you can see, through an angle. Uh, this is a photograph taken in 2014. And so if you sort of go back and forth between the two, you can see uh, how that uh, worked. And um, so since that time, we've had the, the open end uh, available for fishing, which is often used, and um, available for extension into deeper water. So the original goals of the project uh, were, were several. Uh, we wanted to extend the pier into deeper water so that uh, historic and educational ships like the Clearwater and the Freedom Schooner Amistad uh, could uh, visit Ossining and bring uh, their, their educational um, uh, uh, programs to, to the people in Ossining. Um, we also wanted to enable tourist ships for uh, things like sunset tours, autumn leaf tours, uh, and also to uh, service what we hope will be the upcoming uh, Sing Sing Prison Museum um, to possibly bring uh, people on day trips up from the city and bring them back after a uh, museum and other Ossining uh, uh, trip, uh, other Ossining events. We're also interested in uh, transient boating slips for restaurants and, and waterfront events. That's a big thing on the Hudson River now and can be an important source of, um, of, of um, tourist dollars as well as uh, you know, tourist time on, on Ossining uh, ground. In addition, uh, we're very interested from the beginning in ADA compliant end of the pier, end of the pier fishing so that we could get uh, uh, people fishing way out onto the river uh, into deep water with a you know, spectacular 180 degree view around them. At the same time, we were committed to balancing all the stakeholder needs. And uh, that's, we've learned that's easier said than done. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of different stakeholders. And they, they all have um, 
different visions and sometimes uh, conflicting visions. Uh, at the same time, uh, and we think we were successful, and we'll uh, show you how. Uh, at the same time, we, wanna conf we wanted to fulfill the aspirations of the uh, LWRP and of the comprehensive plan, uh, both of which speak about development of the waterfront and uh, 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 peer extensions uh, explicitly, or the comprehensive plan does explicitly. Uh, this shows you just um, a, a few of the kinds of ships that cannot visit Ossining now because uh, we don't have uh, deep enough water, uh, but that could visit Ossining uh, with this pier. Uh, boats like the Hudson River Clearwater, which speak and teach about uh, river ecology as well as the history of commerce on the river. Uh, boats, uh, ships like the Freedom Schooner Amistad, uh, which um, uh, go up and down the, the um, the, sea, uh, the Atlantic seaboard, teaching about uh, the injustices of the um, early American uh, slave trade. This is a replica of the uh, famous, uh, infamous slave ship Amistad. And there are a number of um, replicas of warships that uh, also uh, uh, ply the waters uh, and come into the Hudson uh, and uh, have very interesting programs. And this is one that um, uh, took uh, took part in the War of 1812. We're also interested in the river boat cruises, uh, jazz, dancing, sunsets, autumn leaves. These are just three that um, uh, operate out of New York City, uh, but uh, come up uh, this far. And I uh, had uh, a wonderful sunny afternoon on this one in the, the middle called the Manhattan Two, uh, and it was just spectacular. They're, they're just really fun and uh, uh, luxurious and it's a great way to spend uh, time on the river and uh, learn to appreciate what we have here. Then uh, we have uh, uh, things like the science barge uh, that, uh, that go up and down. This, the, the home port of the science barge is in Yonkers but they, they go around and stop and they have very interesting programs that um, high school and med middle school kids and adults can, um, can come down and enjoy on the weekends or, or the day. So uh, let me talk about the LWRP and how Option 29 uh, fits into it. So this project helps implement uh, specifically policies 1, 1C, 2, and 19. And they're listed here, but I'll just uh, point out a few of the, uh, the key words. Uh, increasing public access to the waterfront, revitalizing the, the downtown waterfront area, uh, including marinas, uh, facilitate the siting of water-dependent uses, and um, uh, let's see, uh, boating facilities, fishing areas, and waterfront parks. So um, uh, the project uh, fulfills those uh, goals very well. And regarding the comprehensive plan, the project helps to implement Chapter 3, uh, which uh, has to do with the waterfront. Objective 2 of that makes Ossining a destination, or is, is to make Ossining a destination for low-impact boating, other water-oriented uses and provide opportunities for waterfront recreation, uh, public access, and most specifically, let me read this whole one, it says the village should continue to actively support and pursue the potential expansion of the village dock to create the ability to provide for more waterfront recreational and tourism boating opportunities. So that's a, that's a direct fit. So let me tell you what we've done up to date on this project specifically. So in 2015, uh, uh, Hudson Valley Arts and Science, with the support from the village uh, and um, uh, uh, GDC, uh, applied for a DC grant uh, for the design and permitting of the extension um, and transient slips, and not for any construction, just so you know, that'll be a, a, another step. Uh, the grant was awarded uh, for $100,000 with an additional 15,000 in match requirement for a total project budget of 115. Uh, we uh, had a first uh, pre-application meeting uh, with the DEC and the Army Corps of Engineers and um, on our side included uh, uh, Hudson Valley Arts and Science, representatives from the village, the town, Ginsburg, uh, Austin and Boat and Canoe Club and um, uh, let's see who else, I, I don't think Clearwater was at that first one but all of the other ones. And from that, we learned that uh, they care very deeply uh, about fish ecology, specifically as regards 
um, shading by any new dock or, or uh, uh, floating docks, uh, you know, shading that, that'll affect the, uh, the river ecology on the bottom, Hudson River navigation, and ADA compliance. These are the three big issues that uh, they, uh, uh, they let us know what they cared about so that we wouldn't go off and build things right off the bat without knowing what they would and, and wouldn't allow. So we had uh, these, the, these general ideas and also very specifics uh, uh, that, you know, a lot of specifics that they uh, uh, gave us uh, in mind as we went through all of the it iterations which uh, led us to iteration 29. So after that, uh, HVAS, Hudson Valley Arts and Science, hired Hydrodata uh, to do bathymetric sonar mapping of the entire Ossining Bay area because the, the bottom of the river changes. And so we had data from 2008, we had data from 2014, but we couldn't rely on that. So we got new data. And um, you can see over here uh, one of the, uh, the plots of that new data. Uh, we've had six formal stakeholder meetings um, where we have hashed out uh, uh, often conflicting visions for um, any development of a, uh, a peer and transient uh, boating. As I mentioned, I think we've come to um, a, a place where everyone's pretty happy with, with what we have. Um, 29 plus design iterations, drawn, circulated, discussed, rejected, or improved. And uh, so we, we're, we're now left with broad stakeholder uh, support for it. And um, we ha as of yesterday, we had uh, letters uh, to that effect from uh, Ginsburg, Austin Boat and Canoe Club, and Clearwater. And Clearwater, by the way, uh, was very helpful to us. They sent uh, a captain and a, uh, an engineer uh, to several of our meetings, and they were um, very knowledgeable uh, not only about their own ship and what they needed uh, to gain access from the south and the north and, and for uh, docking and so forth, but they, um, uh, whenever they spoke, they made sure to generalize to uh, ships of their scale. So some ships have, um, you know, greater uh, maneuverability than them and some not as good, and so uh, we, we learned a lot from them. So uh, this is a drawing of the existing conditions. Uh, and um, the circles here represent the uh, Ossining Boat and Canoe Club historical uh, mooring field. Uh, and over here, and just to orient you, this is the existing pier and the uh, existing uh, Metro North uh, ferry terminal coming out there. That's the restaurant there. That's Ginsburg, and this is Ossining Boat and Canoe Club. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ed Weinstein, who will describe the plan. Hi, good evening. Uh, first thing, I, I think that John Nolan would be very proud of all of us, uh, given the process that we've gone through. Uh, there were times when uh, I personally uh, you know, wasn't sure we'd get there, but uh, we have gotten there, and I think uh, the process worked. I mean, it was a grassroots effort. Uh, we worked very hard to reach uh, a solution that everybody uh, may not have loved every aspect of it, but uh, everybody agreed it would be a benefit uh, across the board. So, what you're looking at here is sort of a uh, sort of a long view, you know, showing the entire. Uh, Revised mooring field, uh, as well as uh, so, the, so the mooring field is you know an area here for smaller boats. Uh, this area would be for larger boats, and you know, frankly, you know the the mooring field could expand, you know, uh, as far to the the west as it needs to to accommodate more more vessels. Because you'll see on another slide how far we are from the actual uh, channel in the Hudson River. Uh, we created this, uh, it's called a fairway, which is a, uh, an area through the mooring field, you know, so that uh, vessels like the Clearwater or other vessels could, uh, could access this dock, which is a floating dock for the Clearwater. It's, uh, it's about 10 by 60. And, w you know, the, the, the rest of the 
things that we've had uh, in this project. We have transient docks both on the, the north side uh, here and on the south side. Uh, you know, and maybe I'll go to the, the larger one so you can see that. So there we go. This, in this slide, the uh, north is, uh, is up. So uh, this is the, that fairway I was talking about. And, and this is the floating dock, which could accommodate some of the visiting vessels. The pier itself would be extended over 200 feet, and, and the last uh, 50 feet or so would, would be uh, designated as a, as a fishing area, uh, you know, out where the water is a little deeper. Uh, it would be ADA compliant, and all that means is that there would be positions on the pier where the railing is lower so that somebody in a wheelchair can, you know, uh, can, can fish from that position. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the Annsville Creek Pier, but that you know, we had designed that some years ago for Peekskill, and that has uh, ADA compliance as well. Uh, the other uh, ADA feature that we're adding uh, will be a ramp, you know, down to the beach from the from the uh, the beginning of the pier. Uh, so the the Metro North, uh, you know, I think will be okay because uh, we're not moving their their pier. One of the options did indeed move their pier, and they. I got them a little excited, uh, and, 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 and <laughs> rightly so. They told us uh, that they wouldn't pay for it and that we'd be responsible for uh, snow removal, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's, that's right, and, and that their timetable is very tight. Uh, so, so that's staying as it is. As I mentioned, these are uh, you know, docks for transient boats. You know, it's not clear, you know, it might be phased to see if, uh, if it can be needed, but uh, we're going to go for the permitting, uh, you know, all at once. Uh, this is a possible, uh, you know, sort of a, a floating barge, which uh, there are several in the, uh, in the lower huts, and they, they call them eco docks, and they're sort of multi-purpose. They have uh, the ability to launch kayaks. It could take other, you know, smaller, smaller boats, uh, and it's another where public access where people could get down a little closer to the water. Uh, and I think, you know, that pretty much covers it. You know, I think, understand that what we're looking at here is a, is a concept drawing. Uh, you know, w w the next hurdle will be to uh, have uh, sort of another s meeting with the regulatory agencies uh, to make sure that this is something they will agree to be permitted. I mean. In, in many ways, you know, the DEC, you know, would like nothing to be built, you know, because they, 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 their mantra is avoid, minimize, mitigate. But given that, you know, this project would benefit the public so much, uh, we think we have strong arguments to make. Uh, and every DEC regulation says that they should take into account not only uh, habitat and, uh, and, uh, you know, fauna, you know, I mean, uh, fish and the wildlife, but they should take into account the economic and social implications of their decisions. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we hope to uh, convince them that uh, the social and economic benefits of this uh, are, are so strong that it's something that they should approve because it's all, it's all water dependent. It's all public access. It's all of the things that the states uh, Coastal Zone Management Program uh, promotes, and so uh, we're, we're looking forward to those meetings. Uh, and uh, and that, that sort of that explains, I think, the technical aspects of this. Any any questions? I'd be happy to answer them. But and uh, let me just page through, see if there's anything else. Uh, some pretty pictures of the the bathymetry. And that this, this shows um, uh, the the dock with the f or the um, the mooring field with the fairways in context of the shipping channel, and you can see that it, it starts to look uh, quite uh, reasonably sized, minimal. This is a mock-up uh, that we did uh, back in the 2008 time frame. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, there was no there was still a beach, and there there's no uh, uh, no Ginsburg there. Uh, but this uh, set of stairs here has been changed to a uh, ramp uh, as per um, uh, DC's uh, request. And um, 
So uh, Ed covered that, and uh, a lot of people uh, contributed. And uh, for anyone who wants to get a copy of, of this, I'll mention that in Appendix 1, uh, you can get the, the data files for these. And Appendix 2 shows uh, most of the 29 if you want to get a, a sense of how things changed. So that's it. We'd be happy to take questions. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Read my mind again, Jamie. Thank you. <coughs> Jamie just said she'll be posting this online so that folks can take a look at the designs um, themselves after today's discussion. Okay, so I'm sure folks have some questions or comments for um, Ed and Gareth and Lynn. Do you want to go first? Sure. I love Godman? going first. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Um, what a journey. Um, impressive. 29 iterations and, and all, this all these constituents that have, well, we, 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 we could only hope that there's only maybe a couple more, but. Uh, Patience was uh, yeah. unending. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, Gareth has been the, uh, the champion of this uh, for years and, uh, and um, you know, we're, we're coming to a really good place here with this and um, I'm, I'm in support of, uh, of, of, of backing the plan. Um, I think I think it'd just be a great, a great amenity for the village and for those who want to access the village and access the river. And I mean, you could. They're too numerous to say at this point how many benefits there would be by building this. So obviously, at some point, we got to talk about the money and how much it's going to cost to do it and how we would do that. But um, to get us to this point is uh, is impressive. So thank you. Um, before I know that there's more questions, but I just want to clarify um, you're coming to us at this stage also so we can decide what are we doing in the next stage and Lynn is we talked about the potential for are we in a reasonable time to consider doing a consolidated funding application for a construction stage and is is that um, what you would like the board's conceptual support of to be able to move forward with that process? I'm not seeing nodding. That was where I thought we left things in our last conversation. If you're going to talk, you got to go up to the microphone there. That's part of it. But initially, right now, as a stakeholder, since we, um, Hudson Valley Arts and Sciences was the, was the lead on the grant, sort of it's like a blessing of that we actually came to option 29. And as a stakeholder group, the village as a whole is supportive. And hopefully, we can take it to the next step and you know look into a C CFA grant to look into the construction and take the uh, option 29 to fruition and actually build it and I'll also just um, mention one thing that we didn't touch on today but we also we reflected in our conversations that the um, the concept here where we talked about having finger transient finger docks on both sides um, construction could possibly take place yes. in, in phases we could do pieces of it and then determine if there's enough demand that we want to do transient docks on both sides or just start with one side and and have some flexibility in that but this is a, a potential that basically worked for everyone that's been at the table. So we, but it, it'd be really surprising if this is what actually gets built exactly as it looks, so. Chan chances are that uh, the agencies will whittle, whittle it down. They can't hear you at home. That's why we keep telling you to go to the microphone, but okay. I was just saying that chances are that once we go before, back before the uh, permitting agencies, they'll whittle it down in, in one way or another. And um, so we want to try to get as much of it permitted as we can. And then uh, from that point, we can decide uh, what to build, uh, what, what pieces of that we want to build when, according to uh, our priorities and the grants that are available and, and so forth. Yeah. I, would, I just wanted to add something about the, the funding. You know, and I've done quite a few you know, projects that have been funded by various state agencies. And, they tend to favor projects that, number one, uh, have had uh, you know, stakeholder involvement. Number two, that uh, involve uh, intermunicipal you know, agreements, and, and we have that there. Uh, and uh, number three, that meet all of the uh, you know, coastal zone management policy. So I think you know, one of the projects that got a lot more money than this would cost would be it was in the village of Greenport. Uh, and they did something very, you know, not similar, but it was a pier and transient docks. And in that case, it was more for motor yachts because they get a lot of uh, boats that cruise uh, up and down the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. But uh, and I'm, I'm optimistic that once we have, uh, you know, uh, the plans 
ready and, and, and agreed to by the regulatory agencies, that'll give the village a leg up in going for future funding. Questions and comments from colleagues? Please. And first and foremost, um, thank you so much for that. Um, it was an update that um, I had been wanting to see because I know that you guys have been at work at this for quite some time. And I know that um, Mayor Garrity and our team have, have been actively engaged. So thank you. Um, um, I am very happy to hear about the eco docs uh, or doc. Um, um, particularly I always, when it comes to any, any project um, on or by public property, I, I, my main priority is the use by our residents and then secondly the use by um, our visitors. Um, so I, I believe that since most Austin residents can only afford kayaks, if they're lucky, um, some boats, that that would be a bigger use, you know, through a rec department and through our, um, and then of course if you have boats and if you could have some educational and tourist, you know, destinations, that's always a plus. Um, to echo De Deputy Mayor Codman's comments, um, I, when we get to the stage, I would definitely like to understand the funding a little better um, and just what it means and how we could actually, you know, get it funded and keep the project going because um, that's obviously a priority and um, th you know again um, end of pier um, when it comes to fishing another attraction for people who are not using boats right and then I guess my other question is um, since the Hudson Valley um, Arts and Sciences right HV yeah um, since there's a lead agency for the project um, when the dock is completed it's still going to be a publicly owned and managed dock, right? Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. My role is uh, has been purely to facilitate this process. So, um, okay, everything will be publicly owned. Thank you. No comments from uh, trustees. <laughs> nope. Um, well, Gareth. Ed, Lynn, thank you. And Gareth, you have been incredibly patient with a, a, a wide range of priorities and concerns and um, really remarkable in your um, persistence and perseverance. And I, I'm delighted by um, not just that we have a final product, but um, the collaborative spirit that has evolved over this time, um, which I uh, you, you have a future career in diplomacy, if you would like it. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I would just say uh, that it, we talk about all of the economic development um, opportunities that this brings, and that's one of the reasons why New York State or one of the agencies that we would apply for a grant for, that would be a big um, priority for them, and that's where there tends to be a lot of funding um, opportunities. Um, but as far as benefits for our community, we talked a little bit about the educational benefits. One of the reasons why Clearwater was happy to send people to be part of these conversations is they very much want to be able to dock somewhere on this side of the Hudson, north of Yonkers. And there's just really very, very little opportunity. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's very difficult for students in our area to be able to um, have opportunities to, to go aboard uh, the clear water by the time they get on a bus and travel to where the boat can dock and then see the boat and then get back it's just not even a feasible um, opportunity for for kids in Austin to be able to participate in so we look forward to the potential for those sort of educational um, ships to be able to be docked here that would uh, be a great um, a great resource for our community but um, more than that you know when we talk about the the DEC yes there's there's definitely have to find a balance between um, the environmental impact of any sort of structure that's being um, expanded on the water but there are environmental very tangible environmental benefits to inviting more people to be connecting with the Hudson River and the more people from our community and, and surrounding communities that spend time on the Hudson River, whether it's on a dock, whether it's kayaking, whether it's at on one of the um, ships that may be visiting, um, people who care about the river seek to protect the river. And that is a much longer term, bigger picture goal that I, I think is um, inherent in this project. And um, I imagine that's part of what motivates you, Gareth, because I know you are a passionate about um, the wildlife in our waterways. So thank you very much. Um, I'm certainly supportive of moving forward this opportunity in whatever way is possible. And if we need to send a letter or pass a resolution to 
formally state that at some stage. I'm getting the sense from the board that everyone says, go for it, let's move forward in the best way we can. Thank you. Alrighty. We've got we've got leaf blower legislation uh, discussion, um, and we'd like to welcome. Um, we just said the name, but I don't have Dr. Dr. Lucy Weinstein. Thank you, Dr. Lucy Weinstein. Oh yes. Any relation? <laughs> <laughs> Very well. So you have an overhead. Um, yes. Yes. Presentation thank you. for us. And I. Uh, I I'll hand them out. Yeah. Bless you. Yes. Oh, here they are. Here they are, just in uh, certainly. Paper. Not too many trees were harmed in this process. <laughs> I, thank you. I'm impressed the gentleman uh, came down from Albany. I thought I'd come the farthest. I came from Huntington, Long Island. He did it probably about 15 minutes longer than I did. So, but I've just learned from being here that this is a village definitely worth visiting, <laughs> and I look forward to coming back when the clear water when the clear water can come and dock here too. But, oh, it's just lovely. So, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it, and my compliments for considering this issue, for being forward thinking, thinking about sustainability. Um, it's really impressive that you're considering this. So I hope to give you some of the, some information that will uh, help you in your decision as to what you'd like to um, to do uh, to go forward um, let's see do we just click no we don't ah okay sorry right the or oh roll, or click to the left that just happens to be my uh, sign on my property just to uh, let the neighbors know that uh, there might be something wrong with these things um, Many of you probably are aware of leaf blowers only in their uh, loud noise capabilities. That's how I originally came to, to think about this um, subject. Um, but after a lot of reading and talking with colleagues, I've learned that they're really a lot more uh, harmful than one might think. Uh, and noise is um, one, of, one of the issues, but certainly not, not the major one. As a pediatrician, I'm particularly concerned uh, about its effects on, uh, and I'm a public health physician as well, on children, on uh, seniors, um, but basically on everybody. Uh, so I'm uh, glad that you're considering doing something about it. Uh, let's see, I should go back to that. Um, so why should you even consider doing something about it? Um, the main problem is gas exhaust pollution, gasoline. Um, these uh, machines, these uh, leaf blowers, are something called two-stroke engines. I had to learn about what that means, but they're one of the few uh, pieces of machinery that are like that. So they're different from lawn mowers and other uh, types of lawn landscape equipment. Uh, they release about 30% of the gas uh, that's in them, just totally unburned into the environment. Uh, so there's that difficulty. And then as they blow, they blow up all kinds of um, unsavory things from, from the ground. Uh, these particulates, they're extremely tiny. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the tinier they are, the further down into the lungs they get, the more harm they uh, cause. And there's a lot of research showing what the problems uh, are with, with these. And then there's the noise pollution, and it's not just an annoyance, although most of us are just kind of annoyed by it. There's a lot of evidence now, um, more so even recently, that noise pollution just by itself, excess noise, is harmful to our health, to our cardiovascular system and uh, other systems as well. Um, just to skip ahead a little bit, because uh, many of you are thinking, well, what else can we use? Um, you may have heard about electric alternatives, uh, electric equipment, and actually, uh, just almost as we speak, ta-da, there's a company that just came out with a very good viable, a very viable, economically uh, acceptable commercial alternative. Um, if that's one thing that you may can be considering in terms of your restrictions, an electric um, uh, backpack uh, blower 
Uh, there are others that are available electric for homeowners, but basically these are lithium ion batteries. No, these are not the batteries that, that catch fire. They're safe. They're actually recyclable. Um, rapid return on investment. They could be uh, powered uh, solar power or with a backup battery or with something called, I don't even know what this means, but apparently the uh, landscapers do, um, an inverter which will charge um, uh, the, the battery, recharge the battery on trucks as the landscapers are going by. Basically the point is that these are viable um, economic alternatives. Landscapers do not lose money. Um, it's understandable. They think they do. Change is difficult. We know that any change is difficult. And many other municipalities that have already instituted restrictions or bans um, have had a lot of, quote, blowback, that's a pun, uh, when they've tried to do this uh, to institute any kind of uh, change. Um, but in the end, um, and you'll see some of the evidence that these communities have shown it's really not a problem that landscapers do find. Homeowners much appreciate the uh, reduced uh, pollution and the noise. Um, ideally rakes and brooms, but we mention that and people say, oh my God, no, you're going back to the dark ages. So most areas where I've given, t in municipalities where we've given talks, we start talking about the electric equipment first. Uh, landscapers much appreciate that. Um, it doesn't eliminate all of the pollution, but at least it eliminates the gas-related, gasoline-related equipment. Uh, and then, of course, mul mulching mowers would be better also. So why um, are we still using them? Well, that's a good question. Um, the perceived benefits uh, are really not anywhere near um, the risks, and so the risks really do outweigh the benefits. What are the perceived benefits? Well, they our landscapers and homeowners probably understandably believe that they're uh, much more efficient um, and they're, uh, they're better. And there's uh, studies comparing, a, there was a, a grandmother in California who's using a rake and a broom compared to a leaf blower, a gasoline a leaf blower and an electric one, and she did just as well as the uh, electric and almost as well in terms of uh, her um, speed and certainly just as uh, well in terms of efficacy than the gas. Um, and it turns out uh, if one does not use gasoline leaf blowers, landscapers actually save money. Gasoline, parts, um, wear and tear, and all kinds of things. What are the risks? I'll go through some of that. Uh, increased equipment costs, um, leaf blowers, uh, worker health hazards. We tend not to think about that, but these uh, poor, mostly, uh, General, I don't mean poor uh, economically. I mean these uh, landscapers that have to work in environments where they have uh, where they have constant noise ringing in their ears from this equipment. Usually, they're not wearing the protective equipment that they're supposed to, and they're breathing these um, fumes as well. Um, hazards to neighbors. If one landscape, uh, if one neighbor rather one one homeowner is using uh, having their landscaper use equipment, or the homeowners using it, many many other yards people, neighbors are affected. It doesn't just affect uh, the one person. Uh, so their health is affected as well. Of course, hearing loss, um, de decreased productivity. They've shown that with uh, the noise, uh, school children are affected, um, people who work at home. It's been said, I think, about 45 percent of people now work somewhat, uh, at least most of the time, from home, and they're affected by all this as well. And of course, increased air pollution, uh, disrupted ecosystems. I'm not going to get into that, but it does affect uh, small animal habitats, um, bird communication with the noise and with the blowing away of the leaves. Um, and recently, actually, for landscape companies, um, sh should be put on notice that there actually have been some law law firms that are um, putting out notices. Have you been harmed by leaf blowers? Are getting into the act too? So that's another risk. Seriously, it's kind of a shame, but well. They are. Um, as a pediatrician, I'm concerned that children are affected um, by these leaf blowers. You know, they breathe faster, they're uh, lower to the ground, and they have organs that are still developing. Uh, so they're very much more affected than, than others. And when they're outside, particularly in the summertime, a lot of uh, municipalities have instituted restrictions when there are so few leaves around in the summer, saying no gasoline leaf blowers, for example, from the end of May to the beginning of October, something like that. Um, because when children are outside, um, when it's warmer, um, they have a greater interaction and they're um, exposed uh, heavily to these um, machines. And who else? It's not just children, of course. It's uh, landscape workers, um, senior citizens, pets. <laughs> we forget about those, but uh, vets have gotten into the act because small animals are affected too. Uh, and certainly those with longer heart disease, um, pregnant women, um, they've shown also. 
uh, thousands of tons of pollutants a year and uh, lots of these chemicals, nitrous oxides, volatile organic compounds, I'm sure you've heard of some of them that are released by the, um, the engines, you know, toluene, benzene, formaldehyde, um, and these tiny particulates, these particles, add carbon monoxide. Um, with um, sunshine in the summertime, um, the um, uh, nitrogen oxides uh, combine um, with the with the air, the sunshine, um, and with heat to form ground level ozone, which it basically incre inc increases the smog level. It's dangerous smog at, at ground level. Uh, so that's, again, it's worse in the summertime, so it's one thing to consider. And there are all these others that are considered by the EPA to be seriously harmful pollutants. Um, they're considered either criteria pollutants, uh, or hazardous air pollutants, which have actually been shown to cause cancer. Can we actually say this one person has been harmed because of a leaf blower, that their cancer is because of it? No, there's the landscape um, proponent, uh, rather a, a leaf blower proponent, a gas leaf blower proponent, who says, can you prove that this is uh, you know, harmed by, this, uh, by the leaf blower? No, but there's very, very good scientific evidence showing that if groups of people are exposed to um, these pollutants from leaf blowers, many more of them are more likely to have these disorders. So there really doesn't seem to be any question on the scientific, from the scientific community that indeed uh, there are these serious health effects. Uh, respiratory irritants, increased cardiovascular disease, uh, and actually seriously increased risk of some cancers. Not a huge increase, um, but if one is exposed for you know, season after season to these leaf blower exhaust fumes, um, it's not good. There have been these um, increased risks. Here's a whole long list of some of the health effects. Uh, overall premature death, basically from particulates and the ozone pollution that's caused by the um, uh, pollutants spewed forth. Uh, increased asthma, and all these have an economic cost. You know, we're talking about the po possible cost to the landscapers by not using it. How about the cost to society, to the individual, when they have children who have asthma attacks, um, elderly who have increased um, uh, lung disease or heart disease as well, wheezing and coughing. All this has to be considered in terms of our economic costs um, of this equipment. And we mentioned the fine particles. Um, they're particularly um, tiny, the ones that are blown up by the leaf blower, the PM 2.5. These, again, go very, very deep into the lungs, and um, they are more hazardous the tinier they are, because they don't get coughed up. Um, it is true that electric leaf blowers don't eliminate that problem, but they are not quite usually as powerful, and it's not quite as bad is why we say, yes, ideally, we would love to have just rakes and brooms. Most people, most municipalities don't find that acceptable yet. It's a continuum. We would love it if you did, <laughs> but we understand. So the electric is a compromise in a sense. It certainly eliminates all that horrible gasoline pollution uh, and the uh, carcinogens that, that, um, that those emit. But we have to admit that the particulates would still be a, a potential problem. It's just not quite as bad. And um, the more powerful the machines are, the worse the stuff is that's blown up. They're mold, fungus spores, pollen, insect eggs. eggs. Um, you don't want to you know, think about this stuff. Animal feces, heavy metals, whatever's on the ground, basically. Uh, five pounds of particulates per leaf blower per hour blown up. And the particulates have been shown to be dangerous. Uh, exposure during pregnancy, increased risk in premature birth, low birth weight, and actually was one study showing that if one is exposed in the third trimester of pregnancy, if a woman is uh, pregnant, uh, it's actually a small increased risk of autism. Again, these are not huge increased risks, but it is a, a small risk of particulates, along with the many other risks that there are. Uh, decreased fertility, heart attacks, okay, it's not good stuff. Uh, worse cognitive function and all these, okay. Um, and the noise. Let's get to the noise. That bothers me more than anything. It's just uh, in my neighborhood, maybe around here too. There's so many different landscape companies coming at different on different days that it's almost every single day when I, you know, try and take a walk outside, and it, it's I, I just hear it from, you know, neighborhood to neighborhood. It's really awful. 
Um, the problem is the noise from the gasoline leaf blower is a particularly noxious one. It's very, very high, high level, considered to be dangerous by the World Health Organization. And it penetrates walls and windows. Even with your windows closed, you can hear it. Oh, I was so pleased to hear that the um, um, Sing Sing, the prison uh, gentle pe gentlemen, were concerned about the noise impact on, uh, on the community, because it's true. It's, and it's more than just an annoyance. Um, and it, you can hear it way down the block. It's not just affecting the uh, homeowner, him or herself. And what actually are the health effects of noise? Uh, increased stress hormones, high blood pressure, abnormal glucose metabolism, which would mean a higher you know, risk of diabetes. I know this sounds like ridiculous from a leaf blower, but yes, there are these proven increased risks. Not huge, but there are, and it's, they're unnecessary. That's the point. We're basically risking the public health for this piece of equipment that really doesn't have any great benefits. Uh, sleep disruption, lost productivity, uh, again, for people who are working from home, uh, impaired communication, social interaction. Um, there are many, many health organizations that have been calling for restrictions or bans. The Medical Society of the State of New York has come out with one, asking basically for the state to um, use different methods to consider restrictions to try and uh, e uh, educate the public as to the harms. Uh, Massachusetts Medical Society, many other parts of the country as well, uh, Academy of Pediatrics, uh, you name it. Every ba major medical organization has come out um, for restrictions or, or bans on this type of equipment. Um, I'm here because the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit at Mount Sinai, which is our area's expert environmental health center, uh, their representative couldn't come, so they asked me to, but they have also come out with uh, letters uh, in support of restrictions. Uh, local hospitals. Um, so I hope, um, I've tried to make this brief, I hope that you'll consider this information. I, um, I trust that you, that you um, will sift through the varying um, opinions and at least err on the side of, of public health when, again, risk versus benefit. Um, I should mention that's not on here that um, anywhere that the restrictions or bans have put in place, and there are at least 16 towns, other towns or villages in uh, Westchester that have already instituted um, some kind of restrictions. And yes, there's, uh, at first, people are angry. Landscapers um, come out in force and will tell you that this will destroy their, um, you know, their livelihood. It turns out it's just not true. Um, I think I've given you one of the letters, testimonials, and a letter from Yonkers, which has instituted a long time ago. And basically, they've said, um, after a while, there's just really not the problem that they might, they might think. Many uh, uh, landscape, landscapers are now changing over to electric and finding their customers are much happier with it, and that they're not losing business, they don't need increased workers, and there really is no downside. So, thank you. Um, thank thank you. you, Dr. Weinstein. Please stay there for a moment, because I imagine we have some questions and comments. This is definitely a topic we've had a number of discussions on, and our Corporation Council has done a significant amount of research. We also received a letter last month from um, Green Ossining, which is uh, our local environmental group, and um, they identified many of the um, compelling reasons that they would like us, the village to consider um, uh, a ban or restrictions on leaf blowers. And they included in that a list of um, the various um, bans. Uh, it, it, it tends to be bans in those summer months that you were, that you were suggesting but, yeah. when they're, when they're um, you know, there's not so many leaves on the ground. And so it's, it's a pretty easy first, uh, first step. But um, I think part of the point is that if we did do some sort of restrictions, we wouldn't be trailblazing here. And it's um, a range of communities, including, as you, you mentioned, Yonkers, White Plains, as well as Bronxville and Dobbs Ferry. It's quite a, quite a variety. Yeah, and, and many others are on the cusp of uh, legislation. Uh, Bedford is seriously considering it. Um, where else? What's that? Oh yeah, Newcastle, uh, just as we speak, you know, <laughs> Maplewood, New Jersey, well, I don't know that's not that local, but we just, uh, I just helped them with their, their ordinance as well, so well, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. I'll um, see if my colleagues have any questions or um, thoughts for the doctor while she's here. Um, thank, thank you for calling. A second, you're supposed to go first. Don't you like to answer first question? Only kidding. 
No, that's just oh, the way it happens. Notice. <laughs> Only kidding. Yeah. I'm, I'm a you team player. Up on that you, notice. you said that last. You said that last. Yeah. Rika has spent a fair amount of time in, in helping prepare for this topic. And we oh, good. Thank you. In, in a fellow Long Islander. Yes. So we've spoken. We just met today, but we've spoken on the phone. Uh, and I and I did actually go to um, and spoke with uh, landscapers, which is what I said I would do a couple months ago, and with our own in um, Austin with. Um, Austin Lawn, um, you know, they supply a, a lot of landscapers to get information, to ask things like how many landscapers do they think actually um, are employed in this area, and they think it's over 500 people. Uh, yeah. Um, no, yeah. You know, and um, so there are big landscapers and little landscapers and single people landscapers, and it's a, li a second livelihood for some, a primary livelihood for right, others, yeah. and it goes on and on. So there are two users. Usually there are the you know, the, both the landscapers, which you did speak about, but there's also the individual homeowner who uses sure. it for whatever it is that they use it, from leaf blowing to, I think, other things as well, yeah. which you didn't <laughs> go into, but right, clearly they thing, do. Yeah. So I didn't really know much about the topic, um, and then went and did some homework and some, you know, asked a bunch of questions. That's how we met. We also had actually um, somebody actually from Austin resident that asked your organization that you represent to actually come and speak to us and that's sort of how some of this happened so this has been really helpful and I appreciate um, you coming up here and um, the Green Austin also as the mayor said has sent and it really is um, a gamut of um, villages and towns and cities White Plains obviously a city um, that looked into and I think our own um, corporation council so thank you for all of this. The medical part, like every time I he listen to a doctor, I start having palpitation <laughs> with, you know, how much damage everything it <laughs> does. Yeah, but I, I, I think you and I did speak on the phone about part of legislation is to look at what problem you're solving for and to balance economic issues, yeah, yeah. livelihoods, Right. That's you know, why and I was all the other things that, trying to um, emphasize right. economically that it isn't that landscapers understandably are very, very fearful that it will reduce their livelihood, that it will increase personal. And it turns out that's just not true. Um, and I provided, I think I have these testimonials I, from I think many, the, many. The one piece that I learned also is that individual homeowners uh, more than landscapers who make money off of this, so it's a cost of doing business, um, is if they just bought a whole bunch of equipment, you know, for an average person, three, four, five, six, seven hundred dollars that now has to get thrown out. Um, and replace, and we have many, many people who where raking is simply not an option. Um, and if you've seen the hills here, unlike Huntington, yeah, I understand. Um, quite a different right. topography, right, and, sure. and lots of old trees, also a different topography. So, it's been interesting to talk to people. So, but I, but yeah. thank you for the, the home, medical aspect. Home, the uh, electric, um, even with cords, uh, for homeowners are really not very expensive, and they're on sale at Home Depot now, at Lowe's. Really, no, they're really <laughs> not bad. I have thank one you. myself. Thank you very, very much. Yes. Um, so to echo Mayor Garrity and Trustee Levin's point, um, we've had a lot of residents. Um, I won't say a lot, but I had three residents. Um, I say a lot because we also had our main um, sustainability group, Green Austin, really go out of their way to give us pretty good information about this um, and to follow the lead of, of many other communities who have, have already found a way to make this work. Um, it's definitely an area that has to be addressed. Um, I kind of, as you were talking, I was putting together what I thought were the stakeholders that had to be part of the process and conversation for us to get to the next step. Um, this is the order that I have so far, but it's totally up for discussion. Um, the first one, health, so I'm glad that you're here, Dr. Weinstein. Um, the second one is labor, right? So obviously all the, all the employees um, that are actually doing the work and how they're being affected um, through all the various ways. Um, three um, is our residents. I use the word residents instead of homeowners because Met um, Austin mm -hmm. has a lot of condo and apartment right. complexes. Rentals, yeah. they're, they're not considered, you know, um, right. so right, right, right. Um, it, uh, it affects all of them. I, I grew up in a, um, a garden apartment complex in Austin all my life, and leaf blowers are part of my upbringing because he wouldn't like a leaf on the grass ever. But it looks beautiful, so I kind of know. Um, um, for the business community, right, so what does the implementation of this actually do? Um, how do they get started? Um, what do they not understand? What do they feel, even though we say we have proof 
Um, how can we actually show that it's, how, how can we verify what, what, what our sources are? Since it is their livelihood and since they are a local business, right? Um, where was it? That was four. Um, five, wildlife, right? It, it affects wildlife, right? So we need someone from wildlife in here to kind of absolutely go into the pros and cons, right? Yeah. Which I think will be um, yeah. more cons in this case, right? Um, and six would be all the advocates, right? Um, you know, why they want to pass, which I think the past five have covered. So um, I look forward to kind of get this Excellent. going. I think yeah. it's pretty doable since we know who the stakeholders are and what information we need to kind of um, have well, a discussion. One suggestion, you know, your yeah, uh, idea about getting stakeholders together, of course, is, a, is an excellent one. And uh, one of the towns on Long Island has done that. They actually established a committee that in included uh, advocates of all, uh, you know, stakeholders of all those. Um, but one thing that works very well, is extremely helpful, is to have somebody there with the equipment to show uh, the um, the landscape, the commercial landscapers are particularly are the ones who are very concerned, to show them, hey, this stuff really, it works, it's doable, um, it's really powerful enough they, that they're happy with it. Um, we did that with Brookhaven National Lab, we brought all the stuff there and they s said, wow, fantastic, and they just switched over. Um, but somebody who is f very familiar with the equipment should be there to talk about longevity, the battery life, this, that, and the other, to, to explain uh, how viable these some of these alternatives are. But, yeah. Thank you for your thank you for your presentation. It was uh, definitely very informative, um, uh, particularly the the health aspects. Um, what stood out to me is the. Um, you know the risk that workers face. As actually, um, uh, not too many people know, but when I was younger, I actually worked with a landscaping company uh, with my uncle. So, uh, you know, I definitely know uh, what, is, what, it, what it means to smell gas <laughs> all yeah. the time. But um, thank you for that. It was yeah, thank you. Yeah, lands the landscape workers um, frequently will come to the physician complaining about tinnitus, you know, ringing in their ears. Um, it's it's really awful, and so many of them unfortunately don't wear the protective equipment. They should be wearing goggles. Things can be blown up into their eyes. There's eye injuries, all kinds of things, and many of them are afraid to say anything to their, you know, many may be undocumented, etc. Um, and they're afraid to say anything to the boss. Um, unfortunately, they they can hire somebody else, so they're really at, at severe at severe risk. Thank you for for mentioning that. Deputy Mayor Codman. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with, you know, the material that you presented uh, today. Um, I've probably, I've probably known a lot about this probably for a decade. Wow, oh, much longer than I have. I and, um, no, I mean, uh, the, I mean, I lived in Vermont for 10 years, so, um, you know, I, I was never a fan of that stuff, and even when I lived up there where there was lots of property and everything else, I was never property, uh, po I was never a big fan of two cycle engines that were not only were loud, but would just pollute the air. So um, to me, it, it, for me, it's not an if, it's it's how it's done. It's, it's how it's phased in. It's, exactly. you know, to, to be respectful to to Trustee Levin and, and, you know, people who've made investments and other things, you know, I think this is something that needs to be phased in over time. I agree with all the stakeholder meetings. I think there's education that has to take place. Absolutely. I think the health, right. I mean, it's all about health. Yeah. I mean, Thank you. To, to, I agree. to see yeah. the increased risks of any number of different diseases because of these fine particles, you know, is, uh, you know, is quite troubling. And we certainly don't need to increase our risks of bad health. Well, and thank you. Uh, and right. so um, um, I would hope that um, all of us here on the board could come to, uh, to some agreement on this and, and move forward and create a plan and, and do all the things that we need to do to move to, to make improvement over time. Oh, thank you so much. That's exactly right. Yeah, um, some towns uh, on Long Island will say it's not if, it's, it's when. It's coming. Electric equipment is coming. I don't think anybody questions that. The only question is, is when. I, um, had a, my, I grew up in the Bronx in a one-bedroom apartment. Um, my parents slept on the pull-out sofa in the living room, but my parents had a tiny, tiny little summer cottage in Golden's Bridge, northern Westchester. And my dad would rake leaves into piles, and I remember just having so much fun as a little kid, you know, jumping into the piles of leaves. But so I'm a Westchester fan too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. Thank you. Um, and and it sounds like there's a, there's some consensus on the board to move forward in in, um, in some fashion with limiting 
Um, and, and exactly what that looks like from a legislative perspective, I think, is to be determined. And we, we've had circular conversations about this um, and haven't really come to a conclusion, but maybe we're feeling a little Obviously, more if there's any more information that you'd like, well, you know, just so, let me know. So I'm a fan of the legislation as proposed, uh, or well, the legislation, like that, not actually legislation as proposed, but, you know, we've, we've talked about this um, at length. Um, so, you know, there are some, some we, we, we've seen what other municipalities have done as far as banning from, say, May to October 1st or May 1st to September 30th. Uh, I'm in favor of that. Um, I do understand that uh, some, some of my colleagues want to definitely do um, more of an education. Um, and, and, and gather stakeholders, but um, can we agree to we have some kind of consensus because people need to respond to something. Uh, so are we going to say this is what we're looking at, like this is the proposed legislation, please respond to it, and then Stuart can kind of do what he, you know. Well, I mean, I already gave Stuart uh, mm -hmm. my proposed legislation, <laughs> you know, two months ago. I um, looked at some of the municipalities because it was presented to all of us and then investigated on my own. Um, and so I do think people do react better to something. Um, then some of the questions I wanted to find out was, which I said I would do um, two, three months ago, was to go to our own vendors and find out about electric lawnmowers and they do have somebody that can come and bring the equipment and do that so I was sort of not thinking in terms of lots of more meetings I was thinking more in terms of there is legislation I would like to um, look at September to December 15th which is when leaves fall so people who are using leaf blowers for other reasons while it's nice not a big fan of using them for everything else um, moving to electric um, into, and I think I said this publicly, into um, grandfathering something so that it's not a big cutoff and keeping it the same hours that we have with other noise issues, which is, I don't know, Stuart, like 7.30, 8.30 in the morning, something like that, and I think John wanted it later in the day and shortening the day, so that was where we were at. So I would like to have something in writing so people can react to um, which is one of the reasons also Dr. Weinstein's here, because I said I, I would actually bring people in to, to discuss some of the stuff, which, while this is not a discussion, a presentation. So um, we do have, there are many municipalities, so I would rather go in sort of with, this is the idea, okay. what you all think about it, rather than the gathering of okay. and the discussion of. But that's that would be my approach. I'm not saying that would be my recommendation. Do we feel like uh, we have, um, an opportunity to reach out to people at the Earth Day Festival on the 21st. Do we want to have information and get people to give a reaction to it? It's just just before I, we answer that. I just um, I haven't seen the proposed legislation, but I do trust um, because I know the time that Trustee Levin um, and also advocates have been working on this. That what it's going to be proposed is pretty similar to other communities in Westchester. <coughs> um, but um, I would feel comfortable um, if we can get that out to everyone on the board for a quick review um, and I'm even open to after we um, if there's no issues which I don't think there from what it sounds like there's going to be no issues um, um, have a public hearing or really um, uh, an area you know opportunity for everyone um, or if they could be um, an audition to you know a public hearing since not everyone goes to that or any or you know events in Austin but it's not, it wouldn't be a formal you know a, yeah it, it's, it's not a formal public it's more, it's more a discussion a, like talk to us and, yeah and, Public outreach and awareness. Um, so but it would be more like putting at. sort of this stuff out, I think, for people yeah. to look at. But I'm in favor of 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 actually getting this going. Um, I just can't do it because I haven't read the legislation. Um, a um, that proposed, um, and B, I, I have to make sure that I talk to the, our business community and some other stakeholders. Um, that's all. Yeah. Where I, so I just, I you're just up. Need, I, well, <laughs> no, but I want to clarify something. There, there was. Initially, when we were doing the noise ordinance, that was in there, but it was taken out at the request of the board. So there is no standalone gas-powered leaf blower legislation because we really didn't have a discussion about what would the period of time you'd want it off. And also, I, I mean, I'm happy to take what are the numerous ordinances throughout Westchester, including. <laughs> no, no. Yes, if, if we have no, no, no. one. 
No, no, I, oh, no because I, I wanted to correct, well, I didn't want to correct the impression that there is in fact a draft floating around uh, because there's not. Uh, there was a discussion uh, when we originally uh, were talking about the noise ordinance and we added the section relating to the generators, the initial iteration of that had a section relating to gas-powered leaf blowers. That was removed uh, because there wasn't a consensus at that point. Uh, but and, and because there were other discussions as to really what it sh what should be in there. Uh, and so, but I can tell you, as Dr. Weinstein has said, what is the most popular thing that you see, primarily in Westchester, which is where most of these are, as a matter of fact, uh, are generally during your summer months, uh, you're not permitted to use gas-powered leaf blowers. There are actually a few communities in Westchester that do not permit any leaf blowers uh, during the summer months. Uh, mm -hmm. The most recent statute passed was in Irvington, which was only a couple of months ago. And they actually have two particular periods of time when you can use your gas-powered leaf blowers, basically fall cleanup times. Uh, and they also have uh, an acreage requirement, which other municipalities mm -hmm. don't. Uh, the only, now what's interesting is Tarrytown is the only municipality yeah. that provides that, uh, uh, and actually Irvington does, does as well, is that a homeowner is effectively exempted from some of these. So if you're an owner, uh, of owner or renter of a one, two, or three family, you're exempted. Tarry, uh, Irvington has that now. Irvington also had it for, uh, for uh, basically cluster developments. But that sunsets on December 31st of this year. So they are doing that. And Irvington also has a, a decibel limit where they're, in fact, going from 75 down to 65 and ultimately to 55 uh, in, in terms of that. But what most of them have is it, that it's basically you, you choose which period of time you want to do. A lot of them go from essentially uh, the Friday before Memorial Day until Labor Day. Uh, some do that. Uh, which is when you, you you're not you're when not it's banned. You, 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 right. where it's banned for your gas-powered leaf blowers, uh, and for your for other uh, uh, and and not just gas-powered leaf blowers, but basically almost any internal combustion type engine is what it, basically what what most of these places come down to, uh, and that for the other type of equipment you could use it during that period, but then you're within the time frame that they set, be it 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Or, or, or something like that. Uh, that's, that, that, that's all in there. Uh, Irvington does have something which is interesting that no one else has, which is that if you have what's basically referred to as a walk-behind type of device, which is what you tend to see on a lot of the larger lawns here, uh, that can only be used on, on property of one half acre or greater. Uh, and uh, Irvington also says that you can't have more than one, you can't be operating more than two leaf blowers on a particular piece of property for more than 30 minutes at any given time. So they have some more restrictions that you don't see in others. But the time frame is basically the same in most. Uh, and again, it's what you see really in Westchester. If you actually go out of the county, uh, you have one or two on Long Island, but it's basically here is where you're going to see it in terms of that. No one has an outright ban. Uh, no one has basically said you can't use them at all, but they, they do tend to do it pretty much during the, uh, the summer months. They make it that it can't be used. As I said, it's all for gas powered. There are a few that actually extend it. Uh, there, is, there are two municipalities that actually require the gas powered leaf blowers to be permitted by the municipality uh, and to show that they are properly Muffler and that they are in compliance with, uh, you know, uh, particular standards with regard to decibel limits and things like that. Just that—that's what it is. But the time frame is really, uh, you know, you can set whatever date you want in terms of that some, those summer months. Um, so what I wrote and what I had proposed I got it. Um, is, let's call it the basic package, which is banning it during the summer months, as described, the hours, the same hours that we allow all work. Um, I did look at the acreage, and I thought that half an acre and up. Um, it's, it becomes, when you talk to the people that sell the equipment, um, the cords and all that, when they get longer, they're just, there's not enough power. You end up having to do twice the work. It doesn't really do anything. So um, in an ossining, it would actually make sense if you did it half an acre and up. Um, you would be exempt from that. Um, and we could choose anything. You could say a third, you could say an acre, you could say whatever, but it would cover probably 80%. In other words, that would cover almost um, 
the entirety of our village, and I think that's fair and not too much of a burden on all parties concerned. But, and, and it's really based on what's out there already, not creating any new, you know, anything. Um, and so I think everything you mentioned is what we had discussed. There was some discussion just for Omar that, you know, maybe just banning them altogether, which no one has done yet, as you just heard. But I would have suggested that even if we consider something that far, um, that it would be grandfathered, you know, over a three-year period or something like that. I mean, people have to have a chance um, to absorb change and not feel as if government is literally telling them what to do on every square inch of their life. And um, then there was a big discussion, which Stuart hasn't brought up, which is enforcement. So the biggest issue really is how does one enforce this? And that's where we left off, if I recall, last time. So, and it's the police, essentially, the way they do all of these things. Is these are the ones who would deal with the noise ordinances. Right. Because, it, these because that's where this would fall in. We that's haven't correct. really discussed that. It's one of the reasons, actually, some municipalities, where there's less police coverage, way upstate and all that, just say, look, passing legislation <laughs> where no one can enforce it is not useful. It may sound good, but it's, it's, it's not useful. But here we actually think within these parameters that we can. And I do believe, by the way, it's landscapers and homeowners, those that have excluded that. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I don't, for me, but that's for where we need a discussion, I think. Trustee Levin, in your memo to me, you said leaf blowers to be used only during the months of September to December. So, September, so that would be, yeah, so they would be banned, Memorial. So, so no, January well, you have September to, to December, September. so you're saying then from January through August, they would be banned? It'll be a longer ban than anybody else. Leaf blowers to be used only during the months of September to December. Because right. I thought that to me is when, yeah. Because I thought I did see a couple of municipalities. Because generally, well, why do you need generally a leaf blower the ban in occurs, February? Generally they're, ban, generally, they're banning it from like Memorial Day. Uh, why do people need, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic. Just do right? they, why does somebody need a leaf blower in February? They, they blow light snow off of their, yeah. their driveways and their walkways. Oh. It can, we, okay. We can set whatever day. Dr. Weinstein, you had something to comment yeah, I was just on with gonna, enforcement. If I, if I might just speak very, very briefly to the issue of enforcement that you that you were bringing up, and you were saying that um, having the, the legislation without enforcement really isn't very useful. But actually, from my my other hat as a medicine person and other fields, um, having legislation on the books does help, even without enforcement. It may not be as effective, but it it takes time. This sort of self enforcement. Um, it takes a few years, and you're right, even with the police not doing it, um, and they're, they're going to be resistant too because it's an extra job for them to do. But neighbors police neighbors, and when it, when they, once the education piece is there that they know it's not, uh, it's not permitted, they basically will tell others and they'll tell. So you don't really have to have the enforcement all set you know, right away. It really isn't quite necessary. Thank you. Can I make the request to have the draft that Trustee Levin submitted to Corporation Council Kahan be emailed to us tomorrow or tonight or whenever, and that way that gives us a week, and then we continue the conversation on the new business, if possible, next week to go over, see if we have any feedback on the proposed draft, and that way it could be, you know, we could actually have a consensus that we're all okay with the draft. Um, by next, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of asking here. I'm not. Question, I'm not I, mean, I don't know. Do you have time to do it by next meeting? Does uh, village manager want to have input? Because what I got from Trustee Levin is essentially a five-paragraph email. It's not. A, it's not a draft in that mm -hmm. sense. Okay. So if you want that, yeah, I mean, I'm, well, you know, but if you're looking, if you're looking for essentially what would be an amendment to the noise ordinance, that can be drafted. But I, I and I'm happy to do that. So that then you can have something that's an actual piece of legislation. Yeah. So why don't yeah why don't we be yes. re begin with sort of the equivalent of a term sheet, which is these are our priorities of what we think should be included okay. in it, and see if we have some consensus on that, which sure. is when the ban takes place, if it affects homeowners. And discuss that next. Okay. Time. We can yes. touch base on that. Yeah, but we it and it's also I think we're it's going not for something in writing versus me discussing an email. Like well, I th I, th I think I kind of wanted to see Trusty Levin's drafted legislation the way she okay, proposed but it. But it's not drafted it legislation. Not draft it's an legislation. email talking about what email well, to the well, you gave the ingredient for the sausage to be made. Now he could put it on the paper. I mean, I, I mean, that's, 
So, so Stuart, you're, it sounds like you're recommending not that we're creating an ordinance specific to leaf blowers, but that this would be a piece of our noise ordinance. Right, but what some places do Thank is you. they have yes. a specific article called lawn maintenance, and they have that in there. Yeah. But basically, within our noise ordinance, we have what's prohibited and not prohibited. Right. Essentially, you add paragraphs that would be relating specifically to yep. that type of equipment. That's and, all I so it would just be part of the noise ordinance. And in our ability to speak yeah. in a concise manner to the public, it would be helpful for us to be able to just cleanly identify these are our goals and these are the measures that we are proposing to, to potentially implement to achieve those goals I'll for the public I'll health, for quality of life, for the health of the workers. I can have that for all of you so that it can be part of a, uh, a continuing business discussion at next week's agenda. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We still have, uh, we have a couple of um, legal issues, but then we have... Um, Exciting progress report from from Debbie. We don't want to we don't want to shirk that conversation. So, um, Stuart, you had some cabaret. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, there are two cabaret licenses tonight for approval. Uh, uh, the first is the uh, uh, Elks Lodge, which has been uh, approved by both the building uh, and uh, and the police, uh, and they're looking for the period of uh, Thursday to Sunday night from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, and with the uh, approval of the uh, uh, board, I would just uh, want to be able to put a, uh, a resolution together for at, at next week's agenda uh, uh, for uh, uh, the granting of that cabaret license. Uh, this is a renewal, and uh, we've had that license in the past. Uh, and the second is for the Boathouse Restaurant, which similarly was approved by both uh, police uh, and fire, uh, by building and, uh, by, and, and fire. Uh, and they're looking for uh, Friday nights and Sunday afternoons, so we would give them the length of time that they, that they need. Uh, and again, with regard to the boathouse, we would ask uh, for the ability to prepare a resolution for the board so that these two uh, cabaret licenses uh, can be presented uh, next week. I'm fine with that. I have no, no comments. These are these are renewals. So yes, it's not. Yeah, it's it's, it's an, and and there have been no objections from our department heads. I imagine you're going to be recusing yourself from the Elks Lodge application. Um, More music is good. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That sounds I'll great. have that Thank for next week. So, DB, I'm going to I'm going to leave it up to you. I know you, we're going to have a pretty in depth conversation right now about the initiatives. We haven't taken a break. Do we need to take a five minute break before we go into this in depth conversation? All right. Then then I'm the board has spoken. We'll be back in a couple of moments. Welcome back. Last but certainly not least oh. is a progress report of the very uh, ambitious list of 2018 initiatives. And Debbie, we are pleased to see that you've already ticked some off of your list and are making progress on others it's with you so and your great. staff. So um, please update us. What, what are, what's all the good news? Yeah, so um, what I presented to you is, is what I think that uh, Jamie and I have both been working on this to come up with a way that we can measure percentage done uh, kind of give you highlights uh, when I present this, which is what's on the right-hand side, like what we've what we've done or what we're waiting on, um, and it's it's color coded just so it's easier to read <laughs> and get you, to a different department. Yes. But you love uh, you love charts I love and breaking charts things and down into colors. into graphs and thank I you. love that too. It so is. It yes. helps us really see what you've got going on here, and we see some hundred percent completions here. So please. Well, I just I hate to stare at a piece of paper that's just all black and white, which is. You know just it's hard to read for me so I think it makes it easier if you're looking for a department you can go there um, so here's some of the things that I've done uh, is I met with all of the department heads and we went over sort of a start date and end date uh, again it's just our first draft of when we think we're going to be able to start those initiatives and then there are some things that we're not really going to start until later but you know we've started to have preliminary call calls on or preliminary investigations and things and so that's that's kind of what's in here um, I did, um, I am recommending that we remove a few things, uh, like if you look at public works utilities, we have sanitation trans transmission 10-year replacement plan. Um, I did not know this when I put it together, but we already have that plan and it's in our capital plan, so it's not really an initiative that we're going to be doing that's new. Uh, when we get ready to do our budget this year, we, you know, we'll, Andy will be updating that. Um, so I don't think it's really something that has to stay on here. Um, I'm very happy to report that some of them are 100% uh, and, and we're marking them complete. Um, 
And I like to do that because it shows that we're making some progress towards a few things. Um, if I, if, if we, the board or myself, add anything new, then you'll see that in the left-hand side where it says added in the month that it was added uh, so that it'll also track a little bit of the new things that come up. Um, so we have, uh, I've I put in the IMAs so that we can start to review some of them in the different departments and I went ahead and added those in. Um, you'll see under community development, conduct the vacancy study for ETBA. We added that in March. Um, and then um, some things are on hold and uh, so I've marked it such. So for example, the update for the comprehensive plan and the parking study right now are on hold um, because we're gonna be doing the vacancy study. We are going to have oh, some where transitions. Are you on this now? Uh, page two. Can I go back to information technology? Are, are we looking at this I'm now? I'm giving you just commenting? a global, uh, you know, what you're looking at and then we can go through it oh, okay. very quickly. Thank you. And you can ask any questions. I'm not really sure that you needed me to go through all of this. I just wanted to sort of ask you if you like the format. Um, so I want to go over the highlights of some important things, but wanted to, because this is the first time you've seen this type of a chart, just want to make sure that you're comfortable with it. So you'll see removed, you'll see on hold, you'll see completed, uh, and anything that's added new. And then uh, I'll, I'll ask Jamie tomorrow to help me figure out how I get the page number in the right place. <laughs> We will put an in there on the top uh, when it is being updated so that uh, if you get multiple versions of this, then you'll be able to tell which one is which. So uh, just to kind of go through the, the highlights of this, uh, everything is on target for public works and streets and sanitation. Uh, those, the, those specific initiatives will happen later on in the year. So you'll see here, right now we're checking on vendors for PCI. Um, but the rest of them aren't going to happen or begin until later on in the year. Um, I have not done the cross-checking to see what things we're starting per month, which I'll do and give you that as well so that we have an idea of what's coming up each month. Um, but this was sort of our, our first, first go at. The water treatment plant design is coming along very nicely and we're getting um, very close to being able to look at some preliminary plans on that and uh, we will be talking with the state about tax status on that new property so Stuart uh, will be working on that with me and we're gonna see what we can do about getting a tax relief on that property because that's gonna be a major major property so and tax burden uh, we see that uh, Bill Garrison was hired um, and a lot of the projects in the Parks and Rec are going to start now that he's on board. But again, uh, later in the year, just to give him some time to kind of get um, everything going for the summer. Uh, information technology. Um, I can tell you that we've, uh, I've talked to two different companies that can do the first two, which is the system breach test and the tenure replacement plan. Uh, so we have selected PM networking consulting and they're going to get started here pretty soon But I don't have any progress on that because they haven't actually Started yet Is uh, that part of like the whole telephone thing No So where's so, the telephone thing that we passed two years ago and sort of You know the better telephone the path thing, I mean, Yeah, there was a whole discussion about better telephones about placement, Like you right? could actually forward calls and, and fancy things like that from the 1990s Right, so uh, we have Craig has one more building to do, and that's the op center. So as soon as he gets that done, he'll be able to put the uh, auto attendant in. Uh, we, at this point, can now do um, inter-office calls to like the op center and, and other locations, and so it's almost done. I don't have it on here because it wasn't something that's, that started in 2018, and it's almost complete. So a better phone system, in fact, like all this I don't even know. I guess it the was, technology pieces, phones, yeah. faxes, all that stuff. I mean, copiers. Wasn't there like, am I crazy? Two years? Did we discuss this a year ago, or two years ago? That we're supposed to do an analysis of all this stuff and that's what number one is and have the a, tenure replacement plan. That's what that is. Yes. So there is software that you can uh, use to map out our whole system, and that's what I want is a okay. full map. So that's what this project. That's is. what that project okay. is. Yes. Yes. Uh, laser fish. 
uh, to the public. So we have all of the documents in the building department are now scanned and we now have internet access for the public to be able to go on and access those documents. Uh, what I'll be working with Jamie and Craig on is a, uh, you know, uh, how, how to access it. And then um, as we start to get our public information request, we can say, you know, yes, we'll process it, but in the future, if you want to use this process, and we'll send it out to everybody that uh, gives us a request for public information. So it is working now, and we're pretty excited about that, so that's why that's at 95%. And uh, as soon as I have that process down on how to access that information, I'll get it to you so you can start sharing it. Oh, I was going to wait until you finish because you said questions at the end, so. Yeah, okay. Um, community development, um, we tried to hire a director, um, but uh, that the, the person that we initially wanted really didn't work out for us, so we're going back to the drawing board and, and seeing what else uh, we can do. We're putting that back out. Uh, our third code enforcement officer, we're pretty excited about that. It's a woman. She be begins on the 23rd. Her name is Charlotte Mountain. and. Uh, She's really excited about coming on board, and she's very um, task-oriented. So I'm looking forward to some of the initiatives that we have as far as inspections and overcrowding and things like that. You know, we can sort of task that, task her with those kind of things. Um, the assistant building inspector, uh, we had to turn the list back in on that, so we have to get the list back from the county uh, because it expired, and so it's coming. We're re-canvassing? Yes, we're re-canvassing. Um, I have talked to uh, Keller Sessions about uh, the planning process guideline that we've talked about wanting uh, for a while, and they said that they had something like that, so I'm looking forward to working with them on, on getting that in place and getting it on the website so that that's the process that we'll, we'll start to use. Um, a lot of these other initiatives, the comprehensive plan, the parking, as I mentioned earlier, we will um, begin those later on in the year because we really need to get fully staffed in that department so we can work efficiently. Question, what is the difference between the parking analysis and the uh, parking study? So it's the same thing, okay. but two different departments working on it. Okay. That's why it's on there twice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, economic development, so tonight I want to talk to you about an economic uh, strategy plan that I sent to all of you this week. Um, business retention will come when we get an economic plan in place. I'm sorry, you said that the comprehensive plan and the conduct of the park analysis on hold because of personnel. That was yes, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so on there, that we also had put enhanced relationship with the chamber. I'm recommending that we just remove that. It's kind of a given. It's not really an initiative. Uh, I had put it on there, but it's, there's not really a deliverable on that. So I'm just recommending that in the future we take that off. On page three, um, finance. So you'll see where we talk about complete the installation for tax and utility, um, complete the payroll installation. Um, we are going to mark those on hold because we are going to be looking for a new software company to provide financial services for us and uh, potentially some clerk functions uh, that allow us to do um, some business tracking. Um, there are some really nice programs out there that will make a lot of things very automatic as far as all the different permits that they need and all of the different licenses that they need to get renewed every year. And, um, you know, meeting with the clerk's office, they would be pretty excited about doing that, but I'm not sure that the program that we have is going to work for us. So you'll see that on hold. Um, the review workflow of, for efficiency, I, I'm recommending that we remove, remove that. Again, there's not really a deliverable. It's just looking at the capacity of the department and all the different things that we have to do. Uh, but I did review add the review the IMA for finance. So you'll see IMA several places. It doesn't really cover all 22 of our IMAs, um, but we will be going through all of them, hopefully. So um, under Jamie, I have, uh, sh you know, we have 100% and complete on the website, and she is working on lots of different uh, programs that can improve our interconnectivity to the website. One of the things I really want to talk to the board about is maybe going with a program that manages our um, agendas, manages all of our minutes, 
manages all of the videos and it is in a format in which it is easier to access, it's easier for you to uh, track and read like on an iPad, make notes, uh, and be able to call up those notes at any time. Um, so we are looking at a program that we'd like to share with you and I'll share some links with you to customers that use it so that you can go and see what I'm talking about. Um, and then we're also looking at a program that will um, create uh, autofill documents and uh, that program will, um, it's, it's a multi-stage uh, program. Initially we get all the fillable documents online and then when we have the um, online payments and online submissions, then we can roll out that part of that so that it makes it very customer friendly. Uh, go online, fill it out, hit the button, it goes in, you can pay online. Um, and, we're, and we are looking at a different vendor for how we pay, especially in Parks and Rec, um, because we think the fees that are being charged right now are exorbitant and um, aren't really conducive to our customers being able to go online and, and register for classes and register for a shelter or whatever. So, you know, that, those are the kind of things that we're moving forward with. Um, any questions on any of this from the broad stroke? What do you think of the format? It's great. That, that's actually my first. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's more feedback. So a dashboard like this uh -huh. is what I think any trustee would want and any person in the public who is watching or reading would want, you know, as far as an update, what's going on in our offices and our departments, this is like trackable, accountable information that is, uh, I would say, uh, definitely reimagined in this village, at least for the past couple of years. I mean, this is like broken down. I mean, even from timelines, who's in charge to, um, so kudos to that. I would love to see a way that um, our department heads could also do that um, and kind of give updates and really break down what they do mm -hmm. um, a bit more. Uh, from like a everyday perspective? Yeah, yeah, oh, uh, sure. yeah operations and all that. Yeah. Um, okay. As far as updates go, mm -hmm. as you know, um, when it comes to access to information and public awareness, um, try not to use the word transparency because that word's so overused, but when it comes to transparency, I am very excited about the, the um, ability for the public to access information on their own. Um, I think it's really going to cut back on valuable staff time. Um, um, and um, my only question is, I'm very happy to hear that the building department is almost, or they're complete with right. their documentation for the old being stuff. scanned for the old stuff. Um, how, and you have to answer this now, how, when will other documentation that is public from other departments be scanned? Um, I kind of want to understand that. So the public stuff in our police department, that's public. The public stuff in our fire department, that's public. Um, Put that on 19's list. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 that's yeah. fine. But okay, like police sure. department does not report to you. I, I understand. That. So when you're saying police department, you're not expecting her to do that because that's not in her in her portfolio or are you I don't know well, no 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 I mean well f first of all we could always have a board of police commissioners meeting to discuss that but um, I want to have a conversation about that if she's the one who is coordinating this software and dealing with the vendor she's gonna have a role in that no matter what so um, maybe we should have a conversation have a board of police commissioners meeting um, to, to you know to discuss access of records, um, public dissemination using the software that's, that's going to be used in the village. Um, but I mean, thank you for clearing that up. Um, that is true. Um, but you know, they are partners. And, you know, and through this, hopefully we could all have you know, information in the same place. Jamie, did you want to comment on that? I did want to say that um, Municity through the building department is available now, and that has the information, a lot of it. Um, I, that's only code, though, isn't it? Only code. So it's that's a part and of it. the laser fish. Right. So, so both that'll, of those all, are okay. now that'll all be there. Right. And then also with regards to information for the police department, I'm um, in the process of developing their subsite right now. Awesome. So and it's not just them; it's all departments. But no, no, yeah. No, but so whatever information that that the chief wants to have on there and have it organized and what have you, that will be. I, I'm imagining probably 
it, 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 once the design is set, it'll probably take about six months for it to develop. That's about how long it took for us to do our site right. here. Yeah. Because they don't You're have any content. You're talking about the website. He's right, talking but, about but public he, but records. They, right. So there's a big, big difference. But there's a place to put that on the site. Right. So but yeah, there is no, a police department. This platform, right now, so. this platform scans public documents. I know it's totally different when it comes to law enforcement, but um, I'm kind of glad we're having this discussion because um, it kind of shows that we have, to have a discussion as to um, what legally should be made public or what is available to the public when it comes to our law enforcement and police officers um, and departments and operations and procedures within the police department and also how that determination is made by the Board of Police Commissioners, the mayor, myself, um, your office, um, and how we're going to be um, a partner on the same level with the police chief in making the determination as to what, um, you know, gets placed on the software. So, um, yeah, so thank you for that. Okay. Other questions and comments? Um, yes. My other question is, is there a way that um, once your office is ready, we could put the community development higher on our open positions page of our website and kind of get a, you know, kind of how we deal with our paralegal with your specs, you know, who qualifies, why we're hiring one, what the process will be, because um, that's also a hire. So I want to make sure that, that that's done. Um, enhancing relationship with the chamber and business groups. We only have one organized business group with the, with the exception of um, BNI, which is uh, business national international. I always get it. Well, it's a it's a group that meets in Austin, <laughs> um, and I think there has to be a difference as to um, when it comes to enhancing our relationships. That's not your your office alone. That has to be everyone. So th this board, you together, um, and at least for that group, that's still a healing process, yeah. right? So. Um, you know, that, that I just, I wouldn't remove just because we're just not there yet with those groups. Um, um, I can't speak for all of us here, but as, a, as, as we're just not there. I mean, I'm a member of the chamber, and I'm not speaking for them. So if, if you're watching, you know, the board, Omar speaking, um, we're, we're just not there yet at all. Um, so that has to be um, not removed. Um, Did you remove it because you think it's just a part of your business, so it's not an initiative? Or yeah, because I don't know how we measure progress. Because these are this is a list of you initiatives, know, not business that tangible things. That initiatives we get done. have like a big like an actual project. Okay. Well, the right. initiatives have the way I define them always is something that has a beginning, middle, and end. Even if it's you know three years, whatever, right. that you get measured against ongoing training staff, working with right. citizen groups, I, which this would qualify. That's why I don't have the other groups that get right. appointed. I mean, I'm a, I read right. it differently than Omar did. I read it like. I'm recommending a removal based on the comment on the side says, hey, it's a part of my job. Right. Not, not it's an not initiative. It's not an initiative. And I, and I don't know how you measure progress. Yeah. I don't know how I say I'm 10% done. There isn't really a budget for that. You know, that. That's why I was recommending that. Right. Um, and just, not that we just, don't want to do it. But. Yeah. Oh, well, no, that actually, I appreciate that because yeah. I know what you mean from the actual project to. Well, that's how I read it. That's um, why we got a clarification. But I mean, that leads me to my next thing, you know, how do we measure progress in that area when it comes to our relationships? Um, but that could be later. Um, really glad to see we're at 30% in the village-owned properties and strategy, really mm -hmm. getting in a comprehensive idea about what we own, what's being used, what's not being used. Right. Um, what it, um, regardless of what its land use is, what is it assessed for, um, um, to then finally be able to entertain and really move forward on the perspective um, ideas for those sites. Um, I think that, that's going to be pretty crucial mm -hmm. as we move forward since we're already talking about potential projects on sites. Right. Um, and that's it. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Thank you. A uh, quick question before you get into uh, the details of the economic strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, under. Um, Review IMA's engineering water and sewer uh -huh. uh, using, uh, I imagine that means Kevin Dorcas? Yes, I found an old report that Kevin Dorca had done uh, for the village that looked at all the IMA's the and said, these are all the things you need to fix. <laughs> so I thought, great. Okay. 
And it was we'll it was use it. it was from 2009 or right. That's what the date was on there. Now is that Kevin Dork or I Kevin Swarker? Yeah, it's just it? a typo. It's Dwarker. Okay. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I said, did I uh, type Jamie it just noticed that. Okay. So okay. Oh yeah. And so he so he worked with the Village before prior to. He did. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So Lisa has been finding and uh, lots of things in the files. I said, you know, go through things and pull out things that are uh, pertinent for today, so that I. I don't want to look at all the history in the village, but anything that's coming up. So okay. she pulled out studies, and she's and uh, Janice has been helping do that and get things organized, and and uh, so I'm finding all kinds of stuff, which okay. is really oh, interesting. Right. So. Oh, that's that's interesting because that was yeah. that thing. It's Dorka. Yeah, sorry. Auto correct. John, did you have any questions? Um, I did want to um, just clarify one thing when it comes to um, we're doing. We put out a, an email. Thank you. The special notice that the paralegal position is available, and there's a time sensitivity because somebody was trained as a paralegal. If they're interested in considering the position, they need to sign up for the civil service test by next. Monday, uh, Monday the 16th. So we wanted to really let folks know about that. If you or somebody you know is a paralegal and is looking to possibly have the wonderful position of working in our corporation council office, that they should um, si reach out to the county and sign up for that so that they can be eligible to interview for the position. Um, when it comes to those other positions that we're talking about um, uh, with uh, the, in the building department, for example, um, that those are all, that's obviously a civil service position. The, the, all the positions we're talking about are civil service positions that have existing lists that you are required to hire off of. That so there's not an opportunity right now for the general public to sign up to right. take a test to 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 be on that list, which is why it's a different strategy for marketing. Right. Could you could you explain what provisional hiring is? Is are municipalities allowed to hire a person and then the next time that the test is available, then they take it? And then they score like is that also an option only if there's not a valid list okay and a valid list is three or more names okay okay I believe every opening has to be posted um, and we could specify um, what the conditions are um, you know there, there's conditional hiring um, there's other roles that require a particular training and certification so um, every role that we hire in this village should be posted before it's hired. I think we, there may actually be an opportunity when you're talking about um, one of those positions where there's not a valid list, right? So we could look um, for a provisional yeah. hire. So that's, that that's a particular position available. we want to be. Yeah, that, that there, when that's an opportunity, we would want to do a better job the way we are with the paralegal to, to, to look more broadly than so what's on a list. I know that I talked to um, HR about posting all of the, uh, everything that's coming up, regardless of whether we have to hire it off a list. The problem that we have with that is then we get hundreds of applications that we can do nothing with and I'm not sure that that's fair right because if you have to apply um, on the civil service site with the county applying to us does you no good you have to apply through the county you have to take the test you have to be on the list. so for those particular so employment opportunities can't we just post them just for the you know so that the public can know that we're hiring and then post the instructions that, you know, please follow this link to the appropriate entity to follow up with your application or to have the opportunity to begin your application process with the County of Westchester. Uh, this is a civil service position, you know. Right, but we don't have any control over when they're going to give the test. So it's not an, so there are some things like if we were to hire a secretarial position, an administrative person, those, those tests are given like routinely. So we could post that and say, hey, we have an, an ad, come, you know, uh, an opportunity coming up. And if you'd like, go to the county website, sign up, take the test. And when we call for the list, if you're on, in the one of the top three, then we can interview so, you. So oh. now that Tanya's here and she's on board, it sounds like it would be a really valuable conversation to have for how can we have um, more information available to the public for all the positions that are being hired with an explanation of um, who might be eligible and how they can find out if they can be eligible, whether it's something that has a test frequently, whether you must be on the list and therefore only the people on the list um, will be eligible, or if it's something that really does have a, a more broad opportunity for hiring. So just, 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 yeah. Yes. Right. And it's very specific in its link directly. It doesn't say it'll apply here. It doesn't right. say not to apply here, but it right. does direct mm -hmm. to the Westchester County website. Right. Right. So, so we know that that test uh, is coming. So this particular. We know we have an ad, but 
if we know that we have let the like the assistant building inspector mm -hmm. we know we're going to hire that we could put it on there and say hey we're hiring an assistant building inspector but you can't apply for it because there's already a list of 40 people right. and that. if you're on the list we're going to canvas you and reach out to you directly Right. So with respect so to that's, the, you know, that's, you know, are we doing a service to the public, letting them know that we're hiring up somebody that they can't apply for because they didn't. didn't if you it list it in a way that they understand that it's an FYI and what you have to do to qualify for the position, if you're in that position, then there's no, there's no reason why not to put it on. Um, you would, for every position, you could go on to um, what the job is. Um, is it paid? What is it paid? Um, is the village hiring? directly if not what is the entity that is hiring or does the procurement for your hiring so in this case it would be a civil service um, department right um, it can go into I mean so many other factors um, for every role because we are a public entity uh, using taxpayer money to pay salaries um, that's that that's kind of the importance of, of listing it um, if we have to um, under all those roles put please note we are not accepting applications because this role is a civil service role however we want to put it um, um, but but I mean it's pretty simple and um, um, I don't really see an obstacle in doing it so how the county does it so that we can model ourselves after that? yeah yeah so they call it like you know on-demand jobs and they call it yeah. civil service jobs so that's what I mean like you know um, back to Mary Garrity's point if we talk to our new um, personnel director if we want to break it down in categories maybe she has a way that she wants to break it down how it best fits when it comes to our hiring and our departments okay. but the goal is that it all it, it will always be there and people know that you know we're being fully honest with who we're hiring why we're hiring and when okay well we can work on Absolutely. figuring out a page mm -hmm. we have a page it's, i can write just rewrite each you know. i think as much as anything it's not that um we have a transparency um, or uh, that we're being honest about who we're hiring but the people who go to our website are people who have a connection to our community and those are people that we want to encourage to seek employment with our community because they have some sort of vested interest here in Ossining so there's there's uh, multiple benefits to it and I'm sure there's an appropriate way to do it yeah, figure it out Could you will do me a favor also start thinking about how to list internships that are available Please. Okay. So, so Omar, uh, you missed an opportunity to say that. No. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I will have tell some. You. We have counselors for the camps. We have. Right. You know, All the seasonal it's, labor. It's, yes. It's one mm -hmm. of my things that like. Many categories of is, ways to get people yeah. on board. Mm -hmm. And and if, if it were me, I would go right on the village side and go like career opportunities, employment up, whatever mm -hmm. the search word is. But I would appreciate that. We don't have what we call interns here. They're seasonal hires. Um, it's a, hmm? Well, so I asked about that because I, you had asked me uh, if, you know, who else has, all of you had asked, who else has interns? And um, Stuart has an intern, but everyone else, it's a seasonal hire. So it's under that classification. It's not really under an internship. Okay. Um, in the water department, because you have to have special uh, technological skills uh, it's still seasonal but it's a skilled seasonal laborer and is that listed somewhere uh, I don't know. well that's what I mean that's what I'm talking right. about I mean you, yeah, I'm you, using the wrong word here yeah. but so seasonal and if it's special skills because you have to be an engineer mm -hmm. or something fine okay right. or you have to be at least one year out of college whatever right yep yep we can work on that great Having an, an, a, a program that's starting in three weeks right. um, to be labeled as as an intern. Yeah. Um, right. It yours, is, yours is tech is totally an intern. Okay. Okay. I just I think, I just think to be clear. Okay. I think what yes. the village manager actually is saying that is the only internship or right. <laughs> okay. they might have. Yeah. Okay. The rest are seasonal. Whatever yeah, they're the called word. seasonal. Okay. Yeah. That's I think the point. Because like I've, I've been very clear to tell everyone that it's not a seasonal hire. It's not a you know an employee. It's yes. yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank but you. We are. We are. We budget for these um, these uh, positions, and we do pay those people. That's why it's okay. a right. seasonal employee. And so. how do you list counselors for the camp? Like, where do I find that if I want to be a counselor? So um, I asked this year. The uh, camp uh, directors will send out a notice of uh, return right. to camp. They did. Yeah, they're yes. already hired. They yeah. did. So they asked the people that they want to ask back 
first, first and, and then wherever exactly. they don't have they have a stack of people that just have walked in and said we want we need a job and they go through that list so they're not having trouble finding people is what you're saying but still that's those are among the seasonal hires that should be listed right. on our but website they could be so, on our yeah, website absolutely sure. and we could do it early so that people have a heads up and I'm sure Tanya's really happy to be able to watch us feeding and see all of the work that she does <laughs> waiting for her uh, in week right. one without Linda. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. yeah, those are good. So um, I do want to go a little bit more in depth on the economic development initiatives that we have here. Yes. Uh, because I would like to get them started, and I want to get them started because I think that it is um, – it is the uh, base or the foundation of a lot of the other things that we're going to be doing. And I had the proposal sent to you by Kamoin Associates, and he had put in there what is different about what he provides than what a planning office would put, provide or an engineering office. Um, and so I just wanted to get your feedback. Um, are you ready to do this? Um, is it because I, I really think that we need to get real data and our and our real markets and know exactly what we're going to do because if if we have a market for housing then what is it and how does that look in relationship to all the things that you are all talking about right now as far as affordability and things like that and if there is a market for uh, businesses I want to know what that is um, and that's what we can get from what I've put in this pro it's in this proposal the thing I like about it the most is that it actually talks about after all of the data is gathered, is sitting down and doing a board retreat uh, where we go through the data and then we also talk about how developers look at your community, how they run their own numbers, and giving you the other side of the equation so that you can see what it is they are looking at and then we can make you know, the board is able then to make decisions on the different policies that you want to enact um, and how that's going to change or shift the market uh, or what that will do for you. So it's, um, it's a lot of data that we don't have. And uh, the data that we do have out there is um, it's just using the American Fact Finder data, and that's not really what we're looking for. We want real market driven here's how much money is in your community here's where it goes here's how people are spending their monies I mean that's all that data is out there but you have to pay for it to get it and then you have to synthesize all of that data um, but if we know what it is that we're targeting we're going to be much more successful at our economic development activities and then as new people come in and want to do more housing we'll have uh, an idea of exactly how that's going to look and then the the other part of that is talking a little bit about incentives and um, I know that we really need to be talking about do we want to offer no incentives and that's the policy of the board or do you want to think about a policy that would allow you to provide an incentive for somebody that's either going to build in an area that you want give you more affordable housing than is required by the code or you know there's something that you want to incentivize somebody to give you so that we're building our community in a way uh, and, and the incentive and then we would provide them with the incentive so um, you know I, I talked a little bit with Quantel about that uh, just to say if, okay well you don't get any if you just follow the law but if you do this because we want more affordable housing so if you do more then we give you a little bit of uh, an incentive and then we'd have to talk about how that looks I know pilot is a bad word here um, but pilot is is really something that uh, I think would be good uh, to work out and what that really means to us, what it means to our school system, and uh, what is it that we want to incentivize because if we do nothing, um, then we take the risk of waiting for somebody to come. and We could wait a long time or we could not wait a long time. Um, but based on my very short tenure here, we've had three people come in and want to do projects uh, one of them's already walked away because they couldn't make the financial um, numbers work without some sort of uh, an investment by the village. So um, I think that it's really important that we all talk the same language and we all understand all the terms exactly the same way. And I think that that's the value of a retreat is so that we can actually debate those, talk about those things, and then we can walk away understanding and knowing when we say this word, this is what it means. 
and this is how a developer is going to look at your community. You have a list of them. You want to talk about <laughs> Trustee Baysmore? Why don't you kick us off, and then we'll fill in any blanks of what you may not have yeah, brought up yet. Go. So uh, I, j I just kind of want to understand, like, like the big picture, because um, we, we had briefly talked about um, an, an economic strategy, and and I just want to I want to understand the big picture. Like, okay. I want to I want to understand. Um, there, there was in the email um, a idea of phase one or phase two, or maybe a possible phase three. Mm -hmm. I just need to understand what those are. What, what that looks like before I before I even go into all of this. Okay, so the phase one is gathering all the data mm -hmm. and synthesizing that mm -hmm. and understanding exactly what it's telling us. Mm -hmm. What type of businesses can we attract to this community? What type of housing? Uh, is there a market for housing? Is there a market for business? And if so, what is it? Mm -hmm. That's what it's going to tell us. So if you think about building a house, we're, we're, that's the foundation mm. of the house. Phase two says, all right, for example, we're going to put a lot of money into 200 Main, uh, Main Street, and we're going to get it ready. Should we do some sort of a market analysis that also says, this is the highest and best use of this property, these are the limitations, this is how you overcome that limitation, and then you can go out and find somebody that can come in and do what you want. Okay. And then like a phase three would be, all right, well, what, where, where's the next place that you want? But you are, you are coming from a position of strength because you know what the data is. You know already what it says. So when you go to a developer and you say, hey, I want you to come here you know, and build something, or I want you to come here and bring a restaurant, you already have the data. Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot of the work for them mm -hmm. up front. Got you. All right. Um, so I, I guess, um, let me just tell you like what I see an economic strategy being, and then just let me know if, if what I'm, you know, if that's actually incorporated here. Okay. okay. Yeah. So to me, like when we're talking about like a, a local, uh, you know, a local economic strategy, it is, is, it is building on the economic strength of the local area, you know, optimizing local resources and capacities. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are linked to regional and, you know, national standards. So. One of the things that is number one, it's always important to understand, like you know, our, our macro economic, like the actual economy that we live in, uh -huh. um, and then definitely understanding regional because um, um, I think um, particularly here in the in the Lower Hudson Valley area, um, particularly here in Westchester, we we don't necessarily think of ourselves as a part of a region. Mm -hmm. Like we we are right. we're 43, 45 municipalities that are trying to come up with our own individual economic strategy. Not understanding that if it's you know if it wasn't for New York City right like where would New York if New York City goes away tomorrow where does that leave Westchester mm -hmm. right um, and then and then you know the economic identifying season business opportunities um, supporting you know entrepreneurship uh, initiatives whether formal or informal mm -hmm. whether micro small or large mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily see that here because it's it's one thing to attract businesses but I kind of want to make sure that we're creating a strategy where we actually really are building on our strengths, right? We, we, we do have a, um, a community. Um, number one, Westchester County is, is, is attracting a lot of medical companies, right? A lot of medical billers, um, a lot of, um, you know, uh, Open Door is expanding. Um, we have uh, Columbia Medical Group. Like these are, these are local job creators that we have that are kind of already here. So I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily interested and attracting like you know Ford company, I'm, and I'm just being a little facetious here. I know Ford's not coming here to Austin, um, and then um, and then making sure like it's sustainable, right? Um, you know, Kevin Dorka talks about job creation. Like there should be something where we are uh, we're, we're we're contributing to poverty reduction, like that 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 we're creating local wealth, right? That we are, you know, no matter whether you're rich or you are working class, that you have an ability to thrive. Like there has to be um, this has to be inclusive, and I'm not necessarily seeing that in this proposal. Yeah, because that's phase three. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I, I just, because I, again, it's, it's just, it's yes. just important mm -hmm. um, for, for, for me to make sure it's there. That's why I asked you for big yes. picture. Right. So that you know, we think about it as mm -hmm. a building block and a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. So we get the data first. We do a couple of uh, high-profile areas, and mm -hmm. then we look at the sustainable model. But we know that we're going to be trying to attract jobs for certain industries because mm -hmm. we know they're going to be able to work mm -hmm. here. 
because we have that data. Okay. And then with respects to like, you know, the RC business analysts um, data that this particular uh, company uses, um, can we subscribe to that data? Right. That's really expensive. Like, like, what is the cost? Because mm -hmm. my next question is, how long is this economic strategy supposed to last? Ten like, years. Okay. So, all right. And I and I'll just say just just my my last comment with respects to, um, you know, the, the companies like from upstate New York. Yep. Um, oh, there, there it is. Um, actually, also like when you in in your proposal when you talk about feasibility and, you, and you're saying let's look at it from a developer standpoint that is, that is helpful but what is more helpful is that we as a local municipality understand all the benefits that um, say the Westchester IDA is giving you know certain kind of developers because mm -hmm. if we don't understand that information then we don't know how to leverage what we feel is best for our community I mean right. um, people can say that the taxes in Westchester are high and they're high everywhere right um, but well particularly with here in Westchester but if we don't understand what Westchester County has all already given them, right? Sure. Then we don't understand like the performer. We don't understand what we can actually leverage. Right. I don't want to be. Part of it. Yeah. I don't want to be in a position where, um, you know, listen. If I was, oh, give me, give me. I need this. I need that. I, I want to know what I can actually leverage. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, that's part of it because uh, part of the board retreat is also going to be looking at those uh, different things that are available mm -hmm. for companies because what we would want to do as a community is get them access to other people's money first. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then if there's a gap, then we talk about our own par private incentive. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, this, those are just OPM the, first. Those are just my few <laughs> comments that I have. Okay. Who's next? We're going, you didn't get to go first again, John. Are you, you, you itching? <clears throat> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I've, you know, I've had a chance to view the proposal I I, th I I like I like the methodology I like the um, the things that they're looking at I don't I don't think we've really had um, this type of an analysis sort of constructed the way they they put it together um, I, I think it's definitely going to give us an interesting lens to, to look at our village so um, I'm all for that I think um, a retreat is, is important so we're all in the room and we're all talking about what we think is really important and um, the direction that we need to go in um, I don't have any problem with the cost I think it, se it seems fair so um, you know I'm, I'd be very interested to pursue this the side of the table <laughs> so for the past 15 years between schooling, college, business, nonprofit, faith based, everyone always impedes on me the importance of data, but never breaks down what the phases actually are. So I appreciate you saying that because I had, a, you know, back to Quantel's point about, about, about poverty and um, those you want to attract versus those we already have versus what we currently have versus what we want to have. Um, I think that's how you use data and explain why we need to gather it first. And I also I think it's an admission that for whatever reason, in the village, we don't have the information we need to move forward currently. I totally agree. We don't have it. Right. Um, my question was, do you think that this, this um, project should come before the hiring of the community development person? Uh, yes, because I think they're independent functions. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That's all. Thank you. So I, I read um, the proposal. Um, it's very templated, right? It's a, you know, it's an empirical study that it's a, it's clearly a very templated approach that they have that they've used elsewhere. I am concerned um, on one hand that they are not familiar, at least with their client base, with this area, um, and frankly, this part of Westchester. Um, so that is a concern of mine, that they're also physically not here, you know, so that, you know, the ability to, they're, they're just, they're not connected um, in any way. And you've used it before? So, so 
Right, so you're, f you're comfortable um, with it. I, I, I would ask that it be more focused on the commercial because they do talk about a housing thing, which might be important, but we just did a study for. But it's a different study. It's, it's so tell me how it's, it's different. A, it's a demand study. So the housing that you did was an analysis of American fact finder that says, hey, you got this much income and you got this much housing and, you know, and it, it's not based in any, any, any metrics that are uh, through these companies that they subscribe to. So they'll get real data and they'll get real income data and they'll get a lot of other things uh, out of that. And so when, when we say it, it's a housing study, it's, it's more about what is this market going to bear for us? So is it going to be single family homes? Is it gonna be condominiums? Is it gonna be apartments? I mean, what is it that we can attract to this community as opposed to how much of it do you have? So it's looking at the market specifically It's different than what Kevin did. The only information they have is public records of purchases and sales. Um, Those aren't public records. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Where, they are when you subscribe real estate. to them. If you, well, if you, have real if estate you subscribe broker, to it, yeah. It's, yeah. they're public yeah, in the sense that they're available. Yeah. They may not be available to somebody in this room, but they're available. Um, and I would assume that when Ginsburg looked at where he wanted to be, he went and hired somebody and looked at where he wanted and did, to be. And, and did their market did analysis. The analysis yep. As have other businesses. So what I like about it is that we get a point of view of developers and whether they come here or skip over us and why. Right. I mean, that would be not the data, that would be the information that I'm hoping. I, I saw a lot of data. Uh, wasn't clear to me that I'm getting information out of all this without paying more. I actually thought their prices were high, by the way, uh, for what they're doing. Because this is like two year out of uh, business school analysis and I don't need to have a senior blah, blah, blah with many hours on this. So I actually found their prices to be a little bit on the high side in this day and age. The, you know, the curve on pricing for analysis has actually gone down over the last five years, not increased the way other professions have because it's become so mechanical in some ways. Um, so I actually found their prices to be a little bit out there and I would actually, you know, now that I'm on the microphone and they can hear it, but I actually found that, that, that I think they're high. Um, so I'm missing a little bit out of their template and I don't have problems with templates, the information that I'm gonna garner. So if you said to me, you know, you're now gonna get to see what a major developer would probably look at before they came into Austin or said I'm skipping over Austin and going to whatever Yorktown Bedford wherever they're going um, or the restaurant business so whatever industry so I'm sort of missing the information and what I do with it beyond data because data then requires me to hire consultants again to then take that and give me something no, else. It, it so includes really the analysis as well and it, and it includes the retreat which is where we dissect all of that and learn from that and decide what direction you want to go in based on so that So your desired outcome, you think that this study will then allow us to sit down and come to some sort of a idea that we are going to go and look for developers or that we're going to or do you think that it's going to tell us what developers are looking at, what banks are looking at, and what commercial developers are looking at versus, is that? So if you want to start an economic development department, which uh, I, I found this. So typical ED, mm -hmm. business retention and expansion, mm -hmm. business attraction, tourism, entrepreneurship, workforce development, those are things that a economic development office right. does. That's why I said it's different than a planning office because planning does planning. Um, if, if we want to start this, we got to know who we're going out to attract and how the tourism works and what, what are we needing as far as what's the, the uh, what are we missing as far as being able to create jobs for the families that actually live here. Um, and, and if you saw those, the data that uh, Patterns for Progress did, it was a little shocking to see our uh, disposable income go down $10,000. So um, that's, that's very disturbing from a community perspective and an economic development perspective. So there has to be a balance, uh, but, but we've got to know what, what it is we're going after because I don't want to just go down to the city and say, hey, you know, bring your restaurant up here. 
and they look at me like I got six heads. If I go down and say, I have this and this and this, and I now have the tools to tell you that mar our market says that you can be successful in our community, I have a much better shot at getting them to consider it. So uh, to, to Rika's point, um, you know, there is a lot of information, you know, already like with respect to like some of this information can be found with the Westchester Economic Development Westchester County Economic Development. Um, me personally, um, and as far as like like part of the proposal says a, a social demographic, what Pattern for Progress did was a pretty good snapshot of what our demographics are and what the income looks like. So I don't necessarily want to pay someone to do that. Like I want to, I understand what the outcome is, but I, I also want to know what kind of information do we already have readily available before we ask another consultant to come and give us something that has already been kind of studied overall. So do you know what our leakage rate is? No. We'll get that out of this. Okay. And also, like, with, with the data, like, I want to know how much, you know, the, the business, the ERSI business analysis is. Like, I, like, if that is something that is constantly being updated, that might be something valuable that the municipality would want to have. I mean, to me, when I looked at the proposal, that was the one thing that we don't necessarily have. Does the county have access to that? Is that something that we can pull from the county, right? I just. Okay, so let me ask you this. Who's going to do the work? You, you can't. <laughs> well, you're, you're not running a Sorry. recreation department <laughs> anymore, so. I mean, I, yeah, and I saw a couple of just, things removed. It's, just, it's not just, <laughs> and that actually, that actually wasn't where I was going, because the truth is you need a business analyst, mm. which is what these people have, and, and she doesn't have that on staff. Mm. And those people make a hell of a lot more mm. than you would imagine as a full-time basis and benefits. That's right. why you hire these people, because that's not how their structure goes. And, you know, the truth is that when you, I, I totally believe you that you looked into what we currently have and surprised that we didn't have information and that it'll take us years. I mean, we could keep talking about it. My only concern about templated projects is that they're oftentimes overly templated and they don't take into account differentiation. And so I need to feel better that this templated consulting is done for auditing and not just and and by the way the oftentimes the mistake is that they look at Westchester okay so Westchester has certain municipalities that look one way and others that look a different way and others that look yet differently from a socioeconomic point of view from a business point of view and we have like no corporation in this village right. no corporation no co right. companies this whole thing's about companies we have none what you want to tell me what big corporation we have Stop and talk. Not big, but we got we have some. No, <laughs> not what they're describing. That's a retail is, store. That's uh, not a big that's not a company. So we have not for profits. Mm. That's not a company. That is a not for profit. They they supply um, jobs. So this is the kind of stuff you're going to get. So there is a there is Phelps that provides empl employment for people who live here. I mean that kind, which I think we do need because people always tell me that, and I actually think that's very accurate. But I don't know if that's like a hundred people, a thousand. You know, like I think. That's where you're going with this. I am just very concerned about out of town views of Westchester and I've met people have views with overly. T so I'm not comfortable with it, but I don't know how to get comfortable with that. And that actually was more my point. I don't believe that we have the wherewithal in our village staff to do this kind of analysis, even if we own the platform, which ain't cheap. And we have not had success with doing that on our own, not as volunteer organizations, not. A, there may be a citizen out there. I'm betting you after this evening there'll be a realtor that will call us and tell us Houlihan Lawrence does this all the time for all their realtors. And you're going to say, well, can you do it for us? And they're like, well, I'm, I'm busy. Well, okay. <laughs> I can't wait online until you're not busy. So I'm okay with that. I like the retreat a lot. I do think that we all speak different languages. I do. Yeah. I mean, I think the five of us speak very different languages. Mm -hmm. and I think that's very representative, by the way, of our community when it comes to understanding um, how we got to where we got here today mm -hmm. and how numbers are interpreted or used. And so having a common language will be, I think, very effective. I don't mean that so we can talk to each other. I mean 
because there is a lot of use of data out there that I think is very misleading, depending on points of view. So I think having a common language will at least have that conversation. So I'd like to um, go to our housing needs assessment because um, what this is to me is moving forward with policy framework recommendation number one. Um, which has been referenced by a couple of the trustees, which is um, to increase village leadership in economic development. Now, they, they were specifically saying hire a, 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 an economic development specialist. We're not looking to put somebody on staff, um, but we don't have somebody on staff to do this, so we're looking to bring somebody in with a specialty in this to bring us um, uh, to a place where we have uh, a plan of action. Um, and, you know, there's six implementation steps here and the first I mean these are all things we've talked about analyze the potential economic return uh, return of redeveloping underutilized or vacant properties we've talked about that in a variety of conversations whether we're talking about you know gardens or housing or jobs it's it's relevant and and we want somebody who is going to really understand the data and analyze it in a way that we don't have anybody on staff to do that and and you know we could go through this whole list but you know the big goal of it is is um to bring in more commercial development to offset the tax burden for the people here and to provide jobs for the people in our right. community. Right. And I would imagine that the, we're, we're most familiar with pilots um, targeting um, housing because housing is the kind of development that um, is the most accessible for developers. It's, it's, it's sort of their bread and butter. They, they can count on it. People pay their rent every month and it's, it's a, it's um, easier to attract. Um, and we've been really fortunate that we've had some uh, developers as uh, the economy's picked up and as Austin's economy particularly has picked up that have um, invested from a housing perspective. And we're looking to do that in um, a, a better, more effective way going forward that really addresses the needs of our community. Um, and we know what some of those incentives are that we don't really know which is what Trustee Basemore is talking about, is, is what are all the aspects of that and what right. are really all the numbers, and then it'll help us with that. I'd also like to understand, is this going to provide us with um, recommendations for how do we incentivize not just housing, but commercial investment that's providing us with jobs? Yeah, there's actually more money out there uh, to help with job creation than there is just housing. Great. Especially in New York. Yes. Great. The issue, though, is we need to know what businesses are going to be successful here by having the data. And then if we know that, then we can look and see if we have enough employment opportunities, if, if we have enough people that are trained to do whatever it is that we need to do. Maybe it's not high skilled, maybe it's, it's but we look at that and then we, we see what we can do to bring people in. Because if I go to a business and I say to them, you know, this is a good market, uh, you can be successful, you know, this is what, these are the benefits you're going to get. And by the way, I have a labor pool that that's lives right here in Austin. It's a lot better sell. Okay, so that's part of what we'd be getting out of this is what you're telling me. Okay. And is this is a snapshot or is there like a three year from now follow up? It's just a one time deal right now. The way this is set up, well, that, correct? that depends on on where the board wants to take it after we get what we get out of this. Okay. Just to clarify, phase one is a one. You get one report at the end of phase one, and then if we choose to move on, then it would start a new phase. Right. Right. So okay. And that's does, where you were saying those. Does things phase do. one, like that price that I saw, is that only for phase one? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a way that I think that um, I I am I'm a I'm not my familiarity with pricing in these particular types of studies is just not there um, um, because we always use the private sector municipal consulting and, um, and services are just completely different than the private sector um, they just are um, so can um, is there somehow that that, um, that you could show us that you know hey compared to the you know others in the market, this is why they came in this price, or this is why they're higher, this is why they're lower. Because, um, you know, it, it is, you could always go cheaper somewhere else, but why? Right. right. So that's all. So were you planning on getting a couple of bids just for us to look at something to compare? I wasn't. And, and I mean, I would be very honest with you, because I know the product that they give. I know that's what I need to do, be successful here for economic development. And I know that the people that I have talked to around here are all planners and they want to look at it from a land use perspective. And I don't. I, I need to do this from a business perspective. It's different. 
I hear you and I understand you you know we hired you for your expertise and you want to bring somebody in to do a project that somebody you've worked with and you have confidence in and you know their work product and what they'll bring to you I will say like Omar, I don't have a great depth of experience for um, how much these things cost, but the, the one somewhat analogous experience we have is with um, the housing needs assessment Kevin Dworka did, which was 50000 but it included a lot of public meetings and public engagement and meetings with us. And I'm really looking forward to uh, this kind of a retreat for us to, to really be a training so we all speak the same language and, and understand um, the facts and, and, and the, this material that's beyond our typical depth of knowledge um, but I just want to make sure we're getting if, if this is the price I want to get as much for it as we possibly can oh, and so meeting a guy one time when we're all done makes me feel like um, it, should there be more um, opportunities for us to meet with him along the way so that he you know especially since we're not familiar with him and we're, not, we're concerned about his familiarity with Austin in the region that we might be able to have some more engagement with him during the process right. Well, I think, uh, so I think uh, I'll go back to him and see if we can renegotiate the price a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about some um, upfront discussions, like face-to-face -face meetings, mm -hmm. so that you will feel more comfortable, but I can do that. But I guess what I'm really asking is, are, are you okay with going in this direction? Just, I, I, I I mean, I, I'm I'm okay, but I I would like to see a revised proposal, or like or some other proposals, just to like just to make sure we're doing due diligence. I mean, that's me personally. I I'm that's where I'm at. But so um, it, just from a just from a process perspective, I understand what you're saying with with doing due diligence. I just kind of feel like I, I I hear what you're saying. I also feel like we did due diligence in hiring Debbie, and I want to you know move this along. But um, but uh. This is there. There's a. Sometimes we cannot just hire somebody without doing a process, and sometimes we can. So could you just take ten seconds and explain to the public why, in this case, we don't have to go out for bid? Yeah. So this is a considered con a, a specialized service. And there's a different term for that. What is it? Professional services. Professionals. It's a professional service. service. So you need yeah. to have certain certifications, and you need to, you know, it's not just anybody can do it. So we're allowed to select someone that we want. It's not a very technical term. Can you help me out? No, <laughs> you're right. Because under the <laughs> policy, that 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 permits to do this process without 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 bidding. I just wanted to add. Let's say you did go out and get a different bid. Um, it my assumption correct that they may not necessarily include, nor think it's necessary for a retreat expense item. So, like, let's say you went to Victoria Garrity LLC. Hers would be. $8,000 cheaper just because she doesn't include a retreat in hers right. but you feel that that it that it connects and it should be in one right okay so that's why it costs more if we don't train you guys then it's gonna I mean that's really the critical piece here you were suggesting that you if if and most of the board is comfortable with moving forward with the general concept that you've presented to us with this mm -hmm. um, entity, um, that your next step would be to go back and talk about what more it might include or renegotiating it to some sure. degree? Uh, um, just that I, it's very, because of our board's different languages, which I agree with Trust 11, and our goal to just have a better working relationship and understanding. Uh, it's very rare that we could have a unanimous vote on stuff, so whenever we can, I always try to strive for it. Is there a way that um, Trustee Bazemore's concerns can be submitted beforehand? So, like, um, as far as like phase two, like how how would they look into poverty, and how would they, you know, the other points that you said, um, not not poverty, but. Um, um, as as a factor and tie them well, together. I, I think I think my thing was like again, um, and, I, and I had said this earlier. That that he was he was from upstate. Um, I you know I personally would like to see what what a local person would present. Um, I think that was my you know not so much of yes. There's a certain 
thing that I believe that local economic development policy should 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 have, and you said that would be in phase three, but I was just more concerned about seeing, you know, we have a lot of people in the lower Hudson Valley area that I think could produce this work. I think we have a lot of partners currently. I, I don't know if Hudson, Hudson uh, Valley, I can't think of their name right now, if they do, the, the person who did the uh, Patterns for Progress. Pattern for Progress, right? They don't do this. Okay. But I just know that there's a, there's, yeah. there's a number of people in, in, you know, that are just closer that can do this, and I was just, you know, I, I would have a... But they do this. So there's no one. From, so from I looked at everybody. I went to the Land Use Center. I looked at Kevin Dworka's stuff. I mean, we have a couple of um, uh, sample. Like, I have a Terrytown Economic Development Plan, and it's all about planning. So they say stuff like, you should foster employment. Okay, but what does that mean? I want somebody to say, this is the employment that's going to be successful in your community. Go get that. Not just foster employment. I think we just need to, we have to have some, um, you know, confidence that you're going to guide us in a wise direction as far as who can provide the services. Um, but there are certainly some priorities that I think we're hearing tonight that, that maybe need to be clarified and, and we want to ensure that they're really being addressed. Um, I don't know enough about how to distinguish uh, if one consulting firm is focused um, in one area versus another and may or may not be able to provide a service. So I'm going to look to you to, to give us guidance on that. And I, but I also realize that you're going with somebody you have a comfort level with. And there are benefits to somebody who's from the outside, just as there are benefits to somebody who's local. Trustee Godman? Well, I'll just say a couple things. Um, you know, we hired Debbie because she has experience in economic development. So. Um, uh, I, I'm comfortable that that the selection that she's making, you know, based on her six months here, is going to benefit us. Um, you know, maybe we need to get the principal to come down here and meet with some of the folks. And you know, I, I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. I think everybody needs to talk to this person and talk about his company and talk about what he does and talk about what he think he would bring value to us. You know, um, you know, right now it's pretty abstract. Um, this is a standard proposal. I mean, it's not, it's not like custom fit for Osning. Yeah, sure, it's a process. It's what they do. It's what, it's what they're about. So yeah, it is, it is a cookie cutter proposal in that respect. Um, but I do feel that the elements are, are definitely things that we haven't been able to understand. The whole notion of, of, of doing, of understanding what type of employment is, what type of employees are available here and what type of companies we should be attracting, that is the, that is the issue. That is the way we're going to do it. When, we, when we're going out to the companies, we want to come here because we have the people that are going to fill their jobs and make their businesses grow. That's what that's about, okay? And that's what, that's what they're proposing to do for us. So, um, you know, that, that's why I like the proposal and I like the strategy because we haven't got that from other people. In the whole time that I've been here, lived here in Osning for 30 years, I've never seen a proposal that said, oh, we're going to figure out like what we're really good at, and then we're going to talk about the kind of businesses that are going to come here and make the difference for us. Because commercial development is by far our biggest weakness, and it's the place that we have to really go. And um, so, so I'm excited by the proposal, but I think you need to get your, your person here to meet with everybody else okay. to create some confidence. Okay. So oh. you started with... Um, a request are we okay with the direction you're going in I'm hearing we're okay with the direction I'm hearing there's a few details no do they really know this environment because th their client list had poor Chester I don't know something that we probably would be okay we'd say oh okay you know Tarrytown so we have that I think so I think your first answer is yes we're comfortable with the direction now details I'm not sure about them so I think that's a great idea to have the principal come down answer some questions we can do that the money look money uh, first of all this whole RFP system in private industry so we're on a microphone telling everybody what everything is so any competitor is now undercutting them and that doesn't make them better and it's you know they just now have that's why in, in private industry you don't do it this way because it's just just tonight we made it totally uncompetitive frankly um, and in fact using their stuff to leverage a competitor to have a better shot at it 
it's I'm not complaining about it but it becomes this sort of piece it is important that it's an expertise that we did hire thank you for mentioning that because that is one of the reasons um, so I think the couple of details if we felt better about that um, would be not only directionally are we okay but now move and the hourly rates and all that listen you know at the end of the day running a retreat professionally is five to seven thousand dollars I mean it's the before the during and the after and there are people talking, oh, I can do it for a thousand yeah this is one of those scenarios that I swear to God I've done so many of these that I always say you get what you pay for I just I'm gonna put it out there you get what you pay for and if it's included as a package by the same I'm feeling actually better about that not worse um, I'm agreeing with you that I think we should bring the person the principal find out who on this team so we get a list of the team but I don't know if they're really just dedicated to us are they working on 14 other things are they sort of outsiders that they bring I mean I just want to hear it from the person we already know that you feel good about them so we don't need to be convinced of that that's done okay I mean I think that now I feel like is that gonna help everybody does it sort of cover 80 percent of people's needs not a hundred percent of everybody's needs just to add to that if they do um, make a decision to come here and kind of you know mm -hmm. talk to us it would be a good opportunity um, for them to consider they don't have to but a good opportunity for them to consider revising the proposal with um, I mean you, you've already heard it from two, two people on the board that it's a cookie cutter format um, so obviously um, I mean I'm not saying go on the on on our village website and, and put our blurb in there but you know um, something a little extra that that, that, that kind of um, even though that will be shown when they come to us but just as an opportunity um, that you know hey 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 they're coming to speak to us next week um, they sent this in advance and they want to explain to you why they've revised this and why they I don't know I'm just thinking out loud but well, thanks, Debbie. Okay. Um, I, I think we've uh, probably done a pretty fair job at um, hashing this out, and you know what your next steps are in reaching right. back out to the um, Rob for this. And um, you know, the reason why it's templated is because this is what they do. We're not we're not their first client, so they're approaching us in the same way they have others. And but what they learn is hopefully going to be really valuable to us in particular, and that's that's the point. Okay, uh, Stuart, we didn't get to hear from you enough tonight. Sometimes it's like oh. Stuart, Stuart, Stuart. But are we done? Do you do you have laryngitis or something? I feel badly. No, Mayor, I do not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cute, Stuart. <laughs> uh, I don't think we have any. Do we have any advice of counsel? I don't know about. Uh, I can give a. Will I'm not looking for it. I'm no. just asking. No. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock. Well, it'll, 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 it'll take five seconds. Okay, we'll do five seconds, but we don't even need to uh, make a motion for that. We're good. No, 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 no executive session. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you very much for joining us for this week's work session. We will be um, back at the Birds All Fagan Police Court facility on Spring Street next week, the 18th, for our regular meeting. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. All right.